And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? <laughs> yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fucking quit. Fugazis. Fugazi. Fugazis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 423 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. For my friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. How's it going, everyone? Big week up north with the World Juniors. All-star rosters are out. And I wonder if everybody here has recuperated from last week. We had a rock'em, sock'em time. So let's check and see how people are feeling. Wit, you weren't staying at the hotel. You are fully recuperated or what? Did you have a rock'em, sock'em time, Wit? <laughs> huh? Oh, Did man. You? Was it I rock'em, a, sock'em? I, I had a phenomenal time. Rock'em, sock'em? Yeah, I'll use that term. Old school Don Cherry, some of the greatest videos I've ever watched. I always remember. Blue, blue, what a rock, dog! Let's go. Rock'em, sock'em, he loved let's... Felix Potvin too, and Alan Best, that old goalie, Alan Best for the Maple Leafs. I think that oh, was his name. But double wristers for Dougie Gilmore, every single one. I got a rock'em sock'em in my stocking a couple of years. You know the old VHS. Just <laughs> oh. if I could have, I might have tugged myself to it right then. But I was like nine. Um, I I think the week went the weekend went phenomenal. It was just such a great time. I know we went over it kind of already on last week's show, but yeah, I was a hurt unit, boys. It was one of those things where you're just like, oh, I had a couple of friends that were at the game and had gone out New Year's Eve. But, you know, we were kind of going for four straight days and I was talking to them, like, how how do you feel right now? I said, I feel absolutely horrific. I can't talk. I can't walk. I can't smile. I can barely sleep. It was a recipe for disaster, what we did to our bodies and our minds. But in the end, Hell of a time. So I think that's usually what ends up being the case is you regret decisions that you made. But in the end, you look back and you wouldn't change a goddamn thing, if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> fellas. So, um, yeah, it's been a pretty relaxing week. Have eaten so well um, for you. Have, buddy. haven't had a sip. I had a I had an IPA on um, Friday night with my dinner. Um, a fiddlehead You're or something crazy, like that. Man. I, oh, I, I got stuff. no big deal brewing or it would have been that. Um, a- other than that, no eating after like 8 p.m., um, I'm zinning the dick off my body, but it's actually a great thing because you zenning, zenning, no zinning. Oh, no free ads. But it's one of those things where if you put one in, I'm like, this is the trick. I'll just if it's in, I'm not going to eat. Right. Because yeah. I tried the old brush my teeth at like eight. And then because you brushed, you're not going to eat again. Well, yeah, you can right. always brush again. That three didn't pack, work. Three packs of m M&M, uh, you love those M M&M, and M, the peanut covered ones. Oh, peanut M and Ms are my jump off. Those things are just so legit. Um, I was, I was, uh, I was thinking You're a we'll snack have a snack whore. Those. And didn't, hey, didn't the old lady, uh, didn't the old lady yell down the stairs a couple yeah, of days so ago? Like, you know, we're both on this little kick. You know, New Year, but but I'm gonna continue it. I just want to lose like, I just want to lose like eight to ten pounds. But um, so she went up to bed. She goes to bed early, and I thought she was asleep. And I went in, and I I I, I don't know what I was doing, but sometimes you need to be held accountable, you know, accountable. And and she, I just heard her, "What are you doing?" <laughs> I'm like, nothing. She's like, "Don't eat anything." I'm like, okay, fair. So I shut the, I slammed. The refrigerator shut in disgust, but you know, then went back to the zinning ways and watched some movies, watched a lot of hockey. And 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 it is, the, I'm not gonna say the doldrums of this season, this is the tough part of the season for a lot of guys. It's just game 40 to 65 usually can be kind of a grind. And and for me, um, I've watched a lot of hockey, but also what a weekend of football! I mean, just the Damar Hamlin story, Buffalo's kick return, we'll get into it later, but I just had a blast on the couch Sunday, just watching games and seeing the playoffs, uh, kind of fall out or, or or figure how it was all going to shake out for next week um i told you guys before on the podcast i don't know if i brought it up when mike richards was on but he got sent down to manchester the year we won the calder cup obviously with the contract situation and um Mirzy, our trainer would always fill up he would have like three different candies i think he had like skittles something but then those peanut m&ms but they were like a fucking the, the jumbo size packed in and then you would turn it and you'd get like five in your hand so, you know, the guys wouldn't splurge too much. Maybe after practice, get a couple handfuls. Richie's Mike, got his two his cups. He's like, no, 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 dude, no. Dude, Mike Richards would have like hundreds of these peanut M&Ms in his hoodie in the pouch. And he would just buzz around for two hours before the game, just eating. You know, I don't know how he didn't play with a fucking tummy ache like, and be puking between every shift. But he uh, he was nasty for us when he was there. He was such an intelligent player, just like watching him, like like how crafty he was with his stick, like on face off. So he was a big help to us. But fuck, 
he used to just cripple those peanut M&Ms. And the other thing you mentioned, when you when I go to Boston, it just sucks me in. You you can't say no to having pops with everybody and just getting fucking buckled and then kind of maybe not eating the best. So I, I, I mean, I love my time in Boston, but it just chews you up and spits you out. I felt like I was on the fucking IR for a week and we actually had to go back and do a TNT broadcast that Wednesday. So oh, another thing too, is when, you know, when, you know, Gretzky comes down for a couple, just to tell a few stories, it's just, oh, you can't say no impossible. Did we discuss last week, the video of that guy getting the handshake? <laughs> from no, no, yeah. I hadn't came. I hadn't seen it yet. That was you the can... funny. And then they scored like a minute later. A minute. That's fucking five seconds. So like, like, my life's changing. So, so sometimes we get some old school guys listening to the pod and they're not all over social media, but I'm sure some I love of you guys. You are, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I love you guys. Honestly, for anyone out there, no Twitter. You're just, you're the best. You're yeah. the yeah. balls. It, give yourself a pat on the back right now for not being one of these losers that lives on the internet like me. Yeah. All of us. Like Donnie in Saskatchewan up riding his tractor right now. Oh, There's no, a, he's on a he horse. A- <laughs> he's going to the he's going to the post office on his horse, Carl. Dude, some of the, the best DMs I've gotten over the years are guys in the tractor, like when they're listening. Like, have you ever seen the That's, inside of a tractor lately? The technology the, is fucking the, crazy in those the things. The coolest picks we get are, are northern Albertans, people in Saskatchewan on the far on their john deers and they're like listen to the podcast it's fucking sick all right especially the ones with the sunset there's guys and maybe some gals out there who are like finding out things that happen maybe first listening to the pod like they're just like oh i didn't even know they're like who's this oh, elon musk guy the boys on chicklets didn't even hey. mention it <laughs> hey who's this elon musk guy they keep talking about <laughs> Yeah, Biz, we had a nice departure in front of the hotel you were heading to atlanta i was getting an uber home a whole mile and oh, a half commute. buddy and uh, it, it was like the next night I, I was sitting here with my wife. I was like, I can't believe he's on fucking TV right now doing a double header. I goes, I can't keep my eyes open at all. Like they're choking. I couldn't choke down a bear. And you were you were grinding, man. You were funny, too. I think you were a little off kilter a little. So you made it even funnier. That oh, we'll get to the TNT. I was, shit I was fucking keeping my yeah, eyes I got open. To, I got a TNT two- question for later. Um, OK, I, I was keeping my eyes open with toothpicks. But speaking of that little rendezvous we had before, you know, TNT gets you the driver. They're the fucking best. They, they the unreal set up. So driver comes, grabs me. We stop off for a pit stop at the outside of RA's hotel for obvious reasons. Bro, I was so gassed from the whole week and, and or weekend leading up. And I must have like left my knapsack open. Somebody stole my fucking jewelry bag. And I luckily I was wearing my one Rolex. I, I'm a watch guy. I don't have a fancy car. I like watches. Shout I had my brick watches. My fur <laughs> I had my fucking Rolex date just in there. My, the first one I'd ever bought me with the Jubilee bracelet. Fuck, dude. Somebody yanked it out of my bag. So I had to file an insurance claim. But RA, I think I was a little off the off the gun because I'd uh, toked up with you beforehand. So you sure it wasn't was, RA? That was. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. I might have right. stolen, but not He's wearing much. it on the pod. He's like, look at this thing I found. <laughs> I'll sell it back to you. 75 cents on the dollar, biz. <laughs> so that was a bit of a kick in the dick. And then, uh, you know, we had to reroute to Charlotte because there was a tornado that hit down in Atlanta. But oh. all, all in all, though, boys, fucking worst things are happening in the world. So, hey, if you work for Delta, though, and just by chance, this thing fell out of my bag because uh, I was I was out to lunch. Fucking help me out. Little to me green jewelry bag that had a, a, a Rolex date just with a jewelry bracelet. And there was also a Bottega Veneta wallet, a brand new one in there that I was going to bust open. So not too bad of a kick in the dick. But hey, if you work for Delta and you find it, send it my way. I love you forever. I'll even give you what? A thousand bucks reward. Is that a good reward? Uh, so bucks. Biz, uh-huh. I have it actually. I'll take that a thousand. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm fucking with you. Oh, don't, see, now you got my hopes up. I've been like hoping like I get like an email about it from Delta every day, man. Just checking my phone. So Dude, you I can't even like get I'll... an email from Delta with like a flight change like info. They'll, <laughs> they'll tell you they'll tell you after the flight left that it left a little earlier than no, it was no, supposed Del- to. They're not going to Del- return your watch. Delta is like the best of the airlines, isn't it? Speaking of airlines, they also- I, I'm I'm flying uh, down to Orlando tomorrow at 5 a.m. to play golf for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, fly home Thursday night. I love you, baby. Thanks for letting me do this. But I need my golf fix. And um, I'm fucking flying Spirit Airline on the way down, dude. Ooh, wow. We should vlog this. Let me geez. say it I again. I never thought this day would come. I am flying Spirit Airline tomorrow morning. Now, I don't think that's that bad. Dude, I think it's, I think it's as bad as you can get. 
I mean, not, I, I might as well be flying on like <laughs> an old plane. They used to like fly cattle across the Atlantic, like in the 50s. I, I, I don't even know if they ever did that, but I just made that up. I, I think what happened was the next earliest flight leaving Boston tomorrow, it was like 730. But I'm like, I want to get there for more golf that day. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'll sacrifice flying on an absolute piece of shit airline. I guess I shouldn't be chirping him before I go, but it won't be out till I'm on the plane. But I, I'm just, yeah, I'm a little scared, a little scared that the bags won't get up, get there, that I won't get there. Hey, the pilot comes out, challenges you like Ernie Els. He's like, hey, I, I listen to the podcast. Got something to say to my face, you fuck. Yeah, what are you doing flying for spirit? <laughs> but I, uh, hey, do you, are you allowed to carry on? Uh, I think it's like 35 bucks. I, I, I got, I, I went to the bank today to get a, a bundle of quarters because apparently you got to put a quarter in to open up the uh, above compartment to put your bag in. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, I yeah, don't it's believe like, it's like playing Pac Man in an old arcade. <laughs> it's like, can anyone got a dime? You're an idiot. All right, like, I got a dime bag. Man, um, all right, what the hell have you been up to? Oof. Sitting around watching movies. Yeah, uh, no, I went heavy on the movies when we had the uh, three days off around Christmas, definitely. But uh, recuperated, man. Like I'm, I'm the the old guy of the crew, obviously. I'm, I mean, I'm middle aged for Christ's sake. Four nights in a row, I had the hotel. I was like, going to take advantage of it. It's not too often. I have hotel rooms in my home city. It was obviously the thing to do. We had all the interviews and the work. And yeah, man, yeah, back to back to back to back, baby. It was the trip we talked about. We were waiting for it. It was going to be a ripper. I wasn't going to be a fucking pussy and stay in the room at all. And I didn't. I, uh, I made the most of it. I paid for it. No regrets. Like Whit said, it was all worth it. Uh, I still had like a bit of a high. You know, when you get like a natural buzz, like, you know, like the weekend we had me in particular. Those are rare family for you. Yeah, no, those natural highs are another one, but just a natural, like you got a buzz off that. It gives you sort of a, a lift. So yeah, that, that was such a great week. So I, I had to recuperate, man. I I was so beat, like I said, my old ass didn't get a ton of sleep, but it was awesome, man. I had such a great time. Just emo emotionally exhausted. Yeah, oh. great. Drained, exactly. Fuck, Ari, we need to get you a spa day after that. Uh, yeah, I could have used one, but hey, we got to rest up, man. We got a we got a pretty busy calendar coming up in February. Yeah. Gee, we haven't talked to you yet. Why don't you share it with us? Gee, what's up, buddy? What's going on, boys? I uh, I got myself into a bit of a uh, predicament. Uh, I have no clothes. Um, so doing laundry here in New York is such a bitch. So I use one of those laundry delivery services. Hundred percent. So they come, yeah, they scoop your laundry, they fold it, they do the whole thing. They deliver it back. And I I started using this new guy and he promised to return my clothes in 24 hours. And that was last Wednesday. Uh, it's been like five or five days now. Uh, his number is like deactivated. Oh, he, he won't answer my calls. He's gone completely dark. And the thing is, is I've been saying I'm not a laundry guy, man. It takes me a while to do my laundry. I build it up. So I just got back from this Boston trip. So I compile all of my laundry, like every piece of clothing I had, I put into four trash bags. I bring it down to my lobby. He comes and picks it up. I don't think I'm ever going to see any of these clothes again. Probably because no, the they're marks. gone. Long they're gone. So he got yeah. sick of the skid marks. He's like, fuck this guy and bring him back his clothes. hundred like, percent. This dude. kid wears white undies with these tire marks. Jesus. <laughs> Tough but, one for me right now, boys. Yeah, you're that in one. sucks. But the good thing is, I mean, all you wear is our merch anyway. So exactly. <laughs> that, that was exactly what my girlfriend said. She goes, hey, just walk back into Barstool and grab a couple more spit and chiclet sweatshirts. That's all you wear anyways. So laundry, laundry is something else. I'll tell you, like my worst. wife's a machine. She does everything like the pool, everything for the house, everything. Everything. I'm telling you, all I do is bring in the cheddar, but she can't even handle the laundry. We've now moved on to the laundry delivery service. It's just and then with kids and then like they're somewhat similar sizes. So like I'm, I am I used to fold. I used to say I'll fold any clothes that are mine, <laughs> but because the kids, it's just laundry. Oh, the sucks. Kids clothes would be such a pain in the ass. Oh, it uh, sucks. wasn't it's it like a little underwear with tire marks like G? I'm pretty sure Alan Iverson was. Uh, well, obviously, he's rich enough, but. He would just leave his clothes. He just would wear them one time and that's it. He would just yeah, get he'd go to the city with nothing and just wear. buy new clothes. Yeah, yeah. That's why he, he did go bankrupt, though. <laughs> well, so, yeah, this is not financial advice for anybody listening. Gee, um, were you stinging all week, too? Like us old guys or what? You bounce back or what? Yeah, I've actually uh, I've been under the weather as well. I haven't been feeling too hot. So it's been uh, I just laid on the couch all weekend with my puppy. So all it, was, uh, it actually just... wasn't a bad. All of our listeners just listen to us bits. They're like, hey, you guys can fucking get therapists. Can we get to some fucking hockey talk? Guys got the headphones I in got while the, he's like. 
drilling a new sidewalk in Chicago. He's like, shut the fuck up. Talk about the Bedard pick. Blackhawk stick. We're going to get him. Even though you're not going to get to the Bruins then. Uh, Biz, actually, actually, we got to shout out to whoever tossed me that box of pre-rolls. That I mean, I had my own stuff in the room, but that's clutch, man. When you don't have time to roll, nice pre-rolls. That's the one we, we burned yeah, up. Yeah, and you're the left. worst roller of all time. Oh, yeah. Can't, can't even do it. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not the best. I'm not the pressure, but I either nail it or I suck at it. Either way, I think shout he's out to doing it because he knows we won't want it. So he's yeah. like, I'll get this whole bitch yeah, to myself. That's, that's the RA mentality. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to bog at it. Outsmart to the head. Us. We do need to thank Marcus Foligno. Uh, he revealed that Minnesota is going to be the next state for big deal. Bruin Biz, tell us how that came about. Uh, we asked Marcus Foligno to announce the state and he did it. <laughs> what was that simple? Good. I <laughs> sent him a tall boy. I hey, said, listen, motherfucker. Slide. I'll By come out of retirement, beat your ass if you don't announce Minnesota for us. And he did. And he's such a fucking handsome stallion doing it. And that is the eighth state that's been announced. Minnesota, we're getting uh, it, it's it's growing as far as a Labatt state. So give it time. If you're having a difficult time finding it, we are launching more cases there very soon. So uh, it's kind of a funky state and how it all works as far as distribution. So just like I said, be patient and you will be able to find it in certain locations. And as soon as we get all those locations, we will let you know. So Minnesota, eight state, seventh Arizona. You guys know the original six and more states coming. Be patient. And Canada coming very soon. Just bear with us. That's all I can say. Fucking legality bullshit. It is coming soon. Gee, That's that it. hat is sick. Um, I'll say this. Not to jump down your throat. Like I invented Pink Whitney. I did it all. Without yeah. me, it's nothing. Biz did nothing. G did nothing. It's all me. I have plenty yeah. of Pink Whitney merch. I don't have any big deal merch. I don't have a hat. I don't have a shirt. I don't have a hoodie. So please, G, please. I got you, you, buddy. I'll send you some right I now. Love, I love that winter lid. That's well, we nice were worried one. about size, right? Based on Bree's recent comments. So we were just, maybe you were in between sizes. So now that we know you're a double XL. Yeah, we'll I went got in a right? car accident, swallowed the airbag. There you go. Uh, what do we got, R.A.? Biz, you mentioned they're waiting for hockey. Well, Canada is very happy this week. Gold medal game versus Czechia. They coughed up a 2 nothing lead. Check it tied in the third period, but Dylan Gunther, the golden goal, unreal goal, unreal game. Goaltenders played out of their minds. And, oh, and by the way, we're going to be talking to him very shortly, but let's first go to the Canadian on the podcast for his take. Well, no, I want to go to Wit because you had Ooh. quite the hot take oh. on the internet on the Twitter ways in the semifinal game when USA got hosed with one of the worst hockey calls I've ever seen in my life. Uh, yeah, well, that that I think that's got over a million views. So no matter what people think of me, I'll take I'll take those numbies. I am well aware, well aware of the rules. OK, I understand in the International Ice Hockey Federation that is considered goaltender interference. It's bullshit, though. I know I know that they got the call correct. I'm doing quotations for anyone in their tractor. <laughs> I understand that's the call. The International Ice Hockey Federation, this is coming from an NHL referee. These exact words I'm about to say have been the number one people in the pussification of hockey. The rules are horrific. I saw guys getting kicked out of the tournament for hits that should have maybe been two minutes for roughing or charging. It's just a complete joke. And the fact that Blake, Jason Blake's son, I play with Jason Blake. The fact his son had the puck on his stick and got a goaltender interference call is a joke, man. I understand in that game, they got the rule right. My video, and I didn't do a good enough job in saying that I know the rules. It's the fact that the rule is pathetic. And by the way, first off, I should not first off, because it's like the 17th thing I've said. Congratulations, Canada. What a team. Uh, great effort. You have a superstar, Bedard. Gunther was unbelievable. It was a, it was a hell of a team. I love that kid, uh, Zellweger, too. Jesus, oh, what is the best? Well, he be. just got a fucking, they traded like a, like a the arena. They gave up the arena to get him. <laughs> and the know, Broncos. Kamloops, Kamloops gave up the next 20 years of their the organization. Owner had to give up his ranch. He's but one of the part kid, owners. Buddy, that kid. Oh, <laughs> He can lug the mail. He can lug the mail. With Drysdale eh? on Anaheim. <laughs> Anaheim's going to be nice. But uh, it was just so disgusting to see a goal scored and a guy with the puck on his stick do a great move. And like, oh, goaltender interference. Like, it's just a horrible, horrible way to ref games. And I and, and if the NHL players do go to the Olympics again, I can't imagine the shit we're going to fucking witness in terms of horrific officiating. I agree with everything you just said, by the way. I think that that 
like obviously not saying that you're aware of the rules just gets all the trolls going, but your breakdown of saying that the pussification of it all and like taking it too far, kind of like when they took too far, like the foot in the crease thing with the Brett Hall, like that whole season was like wasted on such a dumb fucking rule. I agree with you, but I don't think that to the Olympic side of it, they send those, some of those refs, man, they're coming over from other countries and it's just ref completely, completely different. We even had, remember when we had Brendan Prust on the podcast and he talked about going over to Germany and how bad they were there. So I think for these, him hitting, he was running guys (laughs) over that guy hit like a Mack truck. He's like, boom, game suspension. He's like, what? But it is nice that it didn't end up being the deciding goal. Canada went on to lay a trouncing on the U S what was the final link? Six, two. That see, one. that's another thing. Everyone's like, oh, six, two doesn't even matter. We also had another goal called back. That one was that one. That was, was a poke uh, at the pad. For that sure. was a poke at the pad. That was the right call. But it's it's not about the fact that like the goal was called back and you still won by four. It's the fact that it was a three, three game and that would have changed everything. Okay. I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, it doesn't matter because you won by four. Like, no, it's three, three. You ass just pucker up a little bit. It was just I mean, in the end, I love Logan Cooley. I think that yep. Arizona has a stud on their hands. But doing the old, uh, I can't hear you after making it one nothing could have been a little old takes exposed ish. <laughs> I mean, like, used a rapid swipe for that. Luke but Hughes congrats. looked great. So people are saying that maybe at the end of his college career, like he would go up to the Devils right away, like fucking. Oh, Hughes. Yeah, yeah. Hughes. His call, his coach at Michigan said, I, "I think you'll see him in the lineup." And then they have the kid uh, Nemec. So they have both of those D coming. Pasha's just rubbing himself right now over his j- designer jeans he wears. <laughs> and then um, shout out that Juracek uh, defenseman on check. <laughs> it's ugly days in Columbus right now. I think Columbus has one or less goals in seven of their last 12 games. Ugh. And mm-hmm. I know this is defensive, but that guy's got a big game. I love him. But as, as far as Canada is concerned, I mean, we're, we're going to get to talk to uh, Dylan Gunther coming on here. And I'm interested to hear like behind the scenes, you know, going through the early uh, tournament. Uh, I mean, that was a devastating loss. And then facing all that uh, criticism in the media and it being on Canadian soil, I'm sure that was amplified to a, a level that he's never experienced before. That would basically like being a, a Toronto Maple Leaf having to deal with Leafs media. And so they had to go through that. It seemed like just throughout the tournament, like it seemed like such a close group. I'm interested to see if that loss even galvanized them even more where they had to really stick together at that time. And just like the, all the way to the end where you got Bedard after the game, like, fuck off. I ain't talking about myself. I want to talk about this team, this group of guys, what I've been through with them. And then obviously as a, a Coyote and, you know, drafting Dylan Gunther and seeing the impact that he's made on the ice for the Coyotes early in the season so happy that they gave him because you know he's obviously a, a, a big piece of the coyotes roster now but allowing him to go get that experience and then to contribute on that stage that's got to be huge for for fucking his confidence so i'm looking forward to really getting the behind the scenes on uh an incredible run by canada back-to-back gold medals and then uh you know i thought uh you know shane wright had a strong tournament and he got to go prove himself and, and be in that environment again talk about the we, i think we were bringing it up on the tnt call today because um we have uh like the the like the Shane Wright topic and whatnot you know, him getting sent back to junior and like go from like sometimes like the, there's so much pressure on these guys early on and then going from first overall for two years everybody thought to fourth and then all of a sudden like the I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it mayhem but everything he was going on with in Seattle early in the season like that's going to be hard on your confidence but then for him to like go down to the AHL get that experience know that he could at least dominate at that level then get to go come back, score the goal against Montreal, and then go to World Juniors and then be the captain of the gold medal team. You talk about building that confidence back up. I think it's been great for him too. So a lot of great storylines for that Team Canada in this run. And, I mean, you already mentioned Zellweger and, and, and what he's going to be able to do. Yeah, in terms of right, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I've said so many times that there's been certain picks and players that, that just jump in and dominate so quickly that it's just amazing to see the talent in these young guys. But every guy's different. It's fine if you don't play in the league right away, man. You could dominate in the AHL. You could dominate junior. I just hate the fact that there's probably kids out there who get picked high and then, and then they start to panic a little bit. Like, oh, I'm not dominating yet. Look at these other high picks. They did it right away. Buddy, every guy's different. 
Every individual is himself. And 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 you'll hear when we drop Chara in a couple of weeks, his agent came on, Matt Cater, for a little bit and just mentioned this whole game is a marathon, not a sprint. It's about having a long career. Dude, who cares if he gets to the NHL at 21? You got 10, 12 years to make a ton of money. Be a great player. You don't need to do it right away. So I, I always tell young players I meet, like, buddy, don't worry. There's going to be ups and downs. And not every single person is McDavid, obviously. But, I mean, it's just like, don't worry about what others are doing. And... The last thing I'll say on the tournament, disgusting, disgusting to, to win a gold medal three on three. I, I knew they did it all tournament and I knew and I, I thought even in the bronze medal game, I thought it'd be different in the gold if they went to overtime. I'm OK with four and four, but I don't know, like three on three for the gold yeah, medal. What the hell is like that? It. I don't like it either. It's like, what do they get? A, they got a game after us. Is the ice rented? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the, doing the, a the men's league coming on. Honestly, Halifax. up in Canada, it probably is. There's guys with big deal. They're like, we're charging 400 bucks an rink. hour for this ice. Fuck you. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a 20 minute overtime. Why do you got? Why do you got to go to three on three? I don't and know. Change the rules. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask him about that when we when we get to him. All right, before we go any further, we have a few words from our presenting sponsor at Pink Whitney in New Amsterdam Vodka. This stuff has been. Unreal all winter, man. I go across the street, my favorite bar, the Warren Tavern. I get it on rocks over there, maybe Club Soda. We had a big party last week at the uh, Wilbur Theater. Incredible. The pink quit. He was flying. Granelli was doing his little shtick out front. I've been living off this stuff. If you haven't tried it out, go to your local bar, order up a shot, or if you don't want a shot, get it with some Club Soda. That's the way I take it. Either way, you want to get some pink quitty. It's the good stuff. The birdie juice. Granelli, I'm sure you're, you've got a bottle of seven in your fridge. All right. I have a ton of bottles in my fridge. I actually, uh, you know, holiday season's right around the corner. I talk about all the time how I gift it to my uh, my brothers. I put it in their stockings. I talked last pot about how I gifted it to my friends. Well, it's the new year. I have a doorman in my building, so I gift it to my doorman. We have a few different doormen. I bring down a bottle for each of them, and they absolutely love it. Pink Whitney, like we always say, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So absolutely. So head on over to your local bar and order a shot of the Pink Whitney. Uh, we also had some laughs on Twitter, uh, Biz. You said go Yotes after one of Gunther's goals. And our, our buddy Jakey Voracek oh, chimed yeah. in. Biz, shut the fuck up with the Yotes <laughs> sports all the time. LOL. I think he meant to spell tweets. But it was, it was pretty funny. Bring a little levity during the game. There. I mean, he's he's a fucking madman. We, we got to get him back on the show. Fucking somebody. mute me, Voracek. Mute me then. And For half the internet who's... probably does. For anyone new to the pod, go back in time. I think it was we were in Philly, I don't know, four years ago now, three years ago now. What a character Jake Borchick is. Oh, yeah. Just that great guy. Every teammate loves him that's ever played with him. So that was a fun interview. Yeah, my I, captain is how I'm referring to uh, Bedard now because I've already built it in my brain that we're going to get that first overall pick, and I'm already looking towards the future about him leading us, especially after those post-game quotes. In that moment where you've dominated the world juniors to a level nobody else has dominated them, and to just completely deflect it to your team. That's my captain. Yeah, <clears throat> nine goals, 14 assists for 23 points in seven games. Obviously, led the whole tournament. Then he had that quote you just mentioned, Biz. And then he went to, uh, back to Regina. First game back, four goals, two assists, 13 shots on goal. Uh, on the season, he's got uh, 40 goals, 53 assists. If it was an 82-game season, that's a 91-goal, 212-point pace that this kid's on. But just to step out of the gold medal and then go and put fucking six points up, this kid is... I can't wait till we get him in the in the big league, man. It's I heard real. a rumor that like Seattle was going to try to pick him up at one point. Like I don't know how good Regina is in the Western Hockey League. They're not very good, um, right? So I, you I heard think that I think they just he doesn't. I don't know if he doesn't want to be traded or the team doesn't want to trade him, but he's not going anywhere. He's like I I want to get ready for the combine. Get me the and fuck I, out of junior. I'm too good for this league. Uh, I probably go to the if, World Championships if if Zellweger got that return. What I mean. Like half of the half of the Canadian cattle in the Western Hockey League is going to get dealt for Connor Bedard. Uh, we'll the trade whole, you the whole three Yellowstone Boston Ranch. pizza locations and a couple of uh, Smarties. Half the Tim Hortons franchises. And uh, as Jeff mentioned before the show, too, Biz, the financial bump that Bedard has given to these arenas who might who normally wouldn't be selling a lot of these tickets. They're opening up sections that normally might be closed for some of these games. People are coming out to see the kid. They know, you know, he's a generational talent, so he's also providing a financial bump already. So. Yeah, we can't wait till we get him up on the show. Like I said, uh, Seattle sent Shane right back to OHL Kingston with the expectation that he'll be traded for the remainder of the season. Uh, the trade deadline is today, Tuesday. Wait, we never talked about Bedard in some of his interviews. It looks like he's on like a 20 milligram Indica edible. He's just, yeah, I don't know up. if he's a, 
Is he just getting waffled in the locker room like during the game? He's so bored with playing against these losers. Yeah, he's like, I got to start playing super high. And then if I could still do it, then my no, man, I'm going to the Hall of Fame. I don't know what's <laughs> going on with some of those interviews. And for everybody listening, the trade we keep referencing. All right. Do you want to pull it up for like everything that Zellwiger? And I want to say there was one more player uh, going over, but it was for a boatload. Oh, monster trade. One of the biggest I've ever seen at any level, any league. Uh, buddy Jeff Merrick, I believe, broke it. Uh, the Everett Silver Tips traded Anaheim defensive prospect Olin Zellweger and Caps prospect forward Ryan Hofer to the Kamloops Blazers for a bounty of players and picks. Everett's going to get two players, two prospects, four first round picks, a second rounder, a third rounder, a fourth rounder, a fifth rounder, a sixth rounder, and a conditional second rounder. Uh, the 19 year old Zellweger was taken 34th overall in the 21 draft. He's going to Kamloops, Kamloops, like I said, they're hosting the Memorial Cup. So, you know, he'll obviously get some play there. So, but this is, I mean, this trade biz, I, I've never seen anything like, I mean, Lindros Forsberg comes to mind, but this is crazy. That, it's, that preposterous. Amount of picks. it's preposterous. I think I you called know, them the, the Broncos earlier. I meant to say the Kamloops Blazers. I think I said Broncos anyway. I, I, the Shane, only thing, the only thing I'm curious about is like, obviously Kamloops hosts, so they're automatically in the, in the Memorial Cup. So all those teams, they load up. But what happens to, like, the kids who are drafted by Kamloops, I mean, with the picks they have remaining for the next few years? Like, it's almost like, all right, I just got picked to what's going to be the worst team for, what, five, six years? Like, I, I understand, like, there has to be a boatload going back for two players of that caliber to make a run at winning, you know, the biggest trophy in Canadian junior hockey. But it happens at the pro level. Not to this. Not to this. I extent. mean, look at look at what Russell Wilson got. And <laughs> that's worked out well. And, and the Seahawks ended up making playoffs and they get the fifth overall pick. And I think they still got another first rounder and then two seconds and they don't have Russell Wilson. <laughs> So it's happening everywhere. It's a pandemic, bad, bad, horrible, horrible decisions about leveraging the future. And then it completely blowing up in your face. Now, I just hope this is not the team that did that and then loses out in the second round of playoffs and then also doesn't win the Memorial Cup. Because then, like you said, it's like you've leveraged it all. So let's go Blazers. Don't worry, I'm rooting for you, buddy. <laughs> and if not, you could spend a few, you could spend a couple months on my couch if times get that bad, my friend. I love you, donor. I know one of his, I mentioned Luke Hughes a minute ago. It was his coach, uh, Brandon Narado, said he would, quote, bet his mortgage that Hughes will be in the Devil's lineup at the end of the 22-23 wow. season. Okay, yeah. hot taste exposed. Let's yeah. go. Bet the mortgage. And uh, Dylan Gunther, uh, he went back to the Coyotes. He's their ninth overall pick back in 21. He's got 11 points in 21, I think 22 games now after he played the other night. So what do you say, boys? Send it over to him now. Let's do it. Well, we'd like to welcome our first guest to the show. Last Thursday, this 19-year-old scored two goals in the World Junior gold medal game, including the overtime game winner to give Canada back-to-back -back championships. And then Monday night, he resumed his season with the Arizona Coyotes, the team that took him ninth overall at the 2021 draft. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Dylan Gunther, is your head still spinning or what, brother? Yeah, no, thank you. It's an honor. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, pleasure's all ours. Yeah, if you ever had a whirlwind couple of days quite like this, uh, getting a gold medal, then suiting up for an NHL team a couple nights later? No, it's happened pretty quick. The last 48 hours, uh, my phone's been blowing up nonstop. Uh, it's, it's been surreal. I mean, every kid dreams of that, so it's, it's been awesome. How many interviews have you done for this? I did a couple today. I did two today. Uh, I mean, when you texted me about this one, I was stoked. I actually had uh, my my agent uh, text me and ask if I could do one uh, around the same time, and I I said no. So I oh, uh, I have a few is. lined up. <laughs> I thought he was gonna say, "Hey, don't go on there and say something stupid." <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm uh, yeah, super stoked to be on here. So when did you find out that? Uh, I guess it's more of a conversation, but the Coyotes have to let you go back to play World Juniors. Like, when did you find out that that was going to be the case? Yeah, so we were uh, on a road trip when I when I left. We played LA, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, and after the Calgary game, uh, Bill called me up to the front and he said, "You're going to play in Edmonton, and and after you're, you're going to stay in Edmonton and uh, and then head off to the World Juniors." So. I played that game. I uh, had, had a couple of days at home, which is nice, and uh, headed off to Moncton, which is uh, where the camp was. If you wouldn't have said that, would you have asked to go? Like, was that something that you wanted to go do? Uh, I, I don't know if I, I would have asked to go. I, I think uh, at first I was a little bit uh, a little bit bummed out. I'm not going to lie. Like, it, it almost feels like you're getting sent down, like, like a little bit. You have that feeling. But, 
you know, once I, once he kind of explained the reasoning and I, I talked to bear who obviously uh, has been in hockey Canada for so long and had so much to do with them. And once uh, they kind of explained to me and, and showed their side of the story, you know, I was really excited. And, and once I got there and, you know, there's a lot of local guys who I played with growing up five guys from the Edmonton area. So I, I knew a lot of the guys on the team and had built relationships with them and uh, ended up having, having a great time. So I couldn't be happier that I went. Yo, and you guys yeah. lost lost that first game. Uh, did conf- confidence go down at all, or did it actually benefit you kind of later down the line because you might have known some guys' tendencies or whatever? Yeah, I think it it helped us. I, I mean, uh, it's almost good to go through that, I think, just to kind of keep you level-headed a little bit. I mean, we had such a, a skilled, talented team, as the Canadian team always is. And, and uh, yeah, I think us going through that and – kind of having that little bump in the road there brought us down a little bit. It said, you know, we're not going to just uh, walk through this tournament and, and uh, you know, play, play how we want to play and, and, and win the thing. I think we have to play as a team. And, and after uh, that first game, I thought we really played well, uh, you know, kind of as one. Was there money on the board for getting a Michigan done in that first game? <laughs> <laughs> You'd think this was uh, all over you guys. I was ready to fucking fancy. lose my mind. You guys were just, hey, you guys were playing soft. You were playing a little bit too individual, but the perfect learning lesson early in that tournament. And I think you even had quotes about like, hey, we're not going to Michigan our way to the gold medal game here. Like we need to, we need to get on the four check a little bit and stop trying to toe drag guys. Yeah, I think it. Uh, it's not even that I, I, I dislike the play, or I just think like early on in the tournament. Uh, I just thought it kind of leaked into the rest of our game. Like just that, uh, I don't know, not the individuality of it. Us trying to beat guys one-on-one, make pretty plays, stuff like that. And I thought that when we kind of came out and uh, did that, I, I think it leaked in. And and even like the perspective, if you were on the other team and, uh, you know, let's say two of the guys tried that uh, early on in the game, I think that maybe the other team felt a little bit disrespected by that and, and they thought, you know, maybe these guys think it's uh, it's going to be easy. So they, they played really well the rest of the game. Once they got up, they locked it down and, and we couldn't score. I was lucky enough to play in a World Junior in, in Halifax. And I, I long said it was the craziest, most electric atmosphere I ever I ever got to experience. Were you kind of blown away with, with the crowd? And, you know, granted, it's in Canada. Obviously, you know what to expect. But it still must have kind of shocked you in a way of how loud that building got. Oh, I, I had no idea it was like that over there. I'd never been to the East Coast before. And uh, it, it was unbelievable. Even the pre-tournament games in Moncton, uh, they it sold out in the warm-ups. Like, I couldn't believe it, actually. And there's people standing on their feet, uh, you know, with 30 seconds left in the game. And, and it, it, it was so much fun to play there. And uh, that atmosphere was just wild. And I think uh, with the World Juniors, that makes it so special is like they, the kind of whole country gets behind it. And I feel like that's something that, uh, you know, you don't really get anywhere else other than in that tournament. So it was uh, really cool to play in front of a crowd like that. Do you feel like going through that experience of that first game lost though? Cause you even to going towards the end of the tournament, it seemed like the group of guys loved each other. How quickly did you guys gel? And did you use that even more as a bonding moment to like get all on the same page and say, Hey, we got to stick together here. Yeah, I, I think exactly that. I think, uh, you know, we, we have to play as a team, which was a big one. And that that's kind of a big tough obstacle. I think for, for like the Canadian team and the American team is you have so many like really good players within the team who, who have so much skill and talent, but really, I, you know, the team, the team plays better uh, as one. I mean, when you come together as one, you're going to play better. So uh, after that game, we played uh, Germany and our start was really good and we hopped all over them right off the start and, and scored early. And, uh, you know, even though maybe they weren't as good of a team as some of the other teams, uh, I think that that game really helped us uh, step in the right direction. Then you have like 10 points and Bernard had like 14 or something. You guys were just fucking <laughs> snapping it around. Yeah, they had a, a five minute power play. I think it was pretty tight. And then we had a five minute power play uh, late in the second. I think we scored four or five on it. So our our power play uh, was really good and it kind of started on that game. I'm just curious. Did you choose not to play in this in the summer world junior? I know there were some guys who kind of opted out of that. Was that your decision? Uh, no, I, uh, I, I would have went. I had an injury uh, late in okay. the Western League playoffs. Uh, I missed the Memorial Cup too, actually, which was uh, oh. which was a bummer. So it was like pretty close, and I 
I was kind of just getting back on the ice. So I uh, just kind of made the decision to continue to rehab. You mean around the time I helped you guys win the Western League when I came in and gave you guys the, the Oil Kings intro? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was awesome. I I remember that uh, game two of the playoffs. So I, I was injured in game three, actually, first game in Seattle. But yeah, that that was electric. We won that game two uh, after after a first game loss. So that that was a lot of fun. Wayno Wayno texted me in the morning. He goes, "You're going to do this." I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm hung over. Fuck, I can't pull this one off." <laughs> You're like, like, "These young uh, bucks are gonna make fun of me." But hey, I'll tell you what, man. The minute you guys got the little uh, the the pat slap, me go gone. Pit, yeah, when you guys got the beat going, dude, I got right into it. Then I went, I went man biz. I took my hat off, and the boys kind of gave me a chuckle, <laughs> gave me the the confidence I needed. So thank you to the boys, man. That was uh, that must have been a great experience, though, to like win the Western League, have that awesome team, and go on that run as well. Yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun, and I think especially because a lot of us played together for so long, and we didn't get get to play in the playoffs, so it was like. Uh, kind of the last tour off for all of us i mean a lot of guys were 19 and they were moving on so we uh we were pretty fired up i mean we did make some we made some pretty big trades it obviously helped us a lot get there but i think like the core of that team had been together for so long and and uh it felt like forever and to go through that and to win was uh yeah, that, that, that was awesome. It was like a, Zell, a Zellweger type trade where you guys trade away four first <laughs> rounders six second rounders uh, four horse, the, the, the team nuts. bus, and a ranch. <laughs> that was a crazy. I <laughs> I uh, was talking with Zelly. I mean, I no, you can't get traded when you're at the World Juniors. And there was a couple of guys there who thought that maybe they'd get dealt. And uh, I that that's the that's the biggest I've ever seen. I, we traded for Gouley last year, uh, two first round picks, a drafted player, a good young player, and that that was just uh, unbelievable. I mean, he's gonna play thirty games there. Probably that that's crazy. He's he's a he's so good though. That Zellweger. His oh my god! Oh, unbelievable. Yeah, Wit was Wit was stroking him off earlier in the pod, or maybe oh, later, yeah. depending on when we record the recorded <laughs> this. But uh, another guy who might get dealt, a guy who's been all over the airways, but darn, like we got to hear behind the scenes, like what's this kid like? Like what's it like playing with him? His fucking skill set is is through the roof. Best player you've ever shared the ice with, at least not non NHL. Uh oh yeah yeah I. uh I'm just like amazed watching him. Like I, you see him do all these things and I'm trying to figure out like how, how he does it. Cause I'm trying to compare him to like NHL players in the NHL. And I see, I find myself taking the best part of the best players, you know, like Matthew shot and, and uh, McDavid's like shiftiness. Like I, like, I, I don't know, like he's just, he's so good. And uh, you know, he works so hard too. And uh, he's a great guy off the ice. He's modest too. And, he was a lot of fun to be around. And uh, I think the big thing with him is just how deadly his shot is. And when you have to respect the shot like you do as a defenseman, he's able to make those crafty moves and, and make plays. So uh, I think he had a 4-2 and two last night in a 6-3 win against Calgary. So welcome back to the league. <laughs> uh, we, we've <laughs> talked before about the first time Biz and I played with Crosby, and you wonder, like, oh, how good is this guy? And then you see it, you're blown away. So you'd heard about him. He's been such a name for so long. Like, that first time you played Regina, if that was the first time you faced him, were, were you were you kind of going in like, oh, how good can he be? And then right away you knew? Yeah, I uh, played with him with the younger 18 would be the first time. Uh, <laughs> so we were in the bubble, and he, he was lighting up the bubble uh, on the other side. We were kind of like, oh, like, you know, it's uh, the division's not as good. Like something, you know, like we're trying to find like no way he's doing this. Like, come on, he's only fifteen. And then uh, he goes to U eighteens, and uh, I was like, yeah, boys, like this guy is the real deal here. Like he's <laughs> he's he's legit. And uh, after every World Junior game, like we have old group chat with uh, a lot of the former Oil King guys and stuff. And uh, you know, it was buzzing when he would uh, put on a show and score some nice goals there. Does he get banged up before these interviews he does? He's always like, seems like he's a little sauced up. Biz eh? thinks he's he, eating edibles. Is he eating edibles before these interviews? I, I, I don't know. I, he does look a little bit uh, spacey when he's doing I remember the one in the intermission, he, he wasn't even answering the questions. I don't know what, uh, what <laughs> he was doing. People were losing it online about it. I'm like, shut the fuck up, man. He's got three goals for you. Just go to bed. Yeah, I... Uh, I like the guy. You ever seen the coach Chippy guy? He says, uh, but he always talks about Chippy. Bizarre he's the form. best. Yeah. He's uh, so he's like on TikTok and he, uh, he's always talking about how big his forearms are. And he makes videos about him doing curls uh, when he's sleeping and stuff like that. So 
I uh, I like that guy. He's pretty. He's pretty funny. So what does he incorporate Bedard into his his shtick on on TikTok? Hey, yeah, Baze, he I'll like... play. I'll play a clip of it right now. <laughs> Benzie, it's time to get up. We gotta go. Benzie, we gotta get up, buddy. Benzie, it's time to get up. <laughs> bad, Benzie. If I see one, more... bad. That's bad. No more forearm pump. Bad. No more forearm pumps. We got Slovakia in an hour. No more forearm pumps. Bad. Bad, Betsy. Bad. No more forearm pumps. The whole bus is waiting. We got Slovakia in an hour. I'll be there when I'm ready. Your forearms are the size of a tree. Did Dino get you doing the forearm twist? Dino got you doing them? Okay, well, I'm gonna have to talk to Dino. I said I'll be there when I'm ready. So he's got Popeye forearms. Is he is he is he hitting the rice bucket before games, Connor Bedard? Oh, he's he's juiced. He's huge. Yeah, he's been like that since uh, the U eighteen too. I couldn't believe how strong he was. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he's he's strong. Do you think they change his birth certificate? Do you think he's older than he actually is? Are we starting to catch up with with the Russia mentality? No, I don't think he's all right. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Sarms or something in there. We could have a lead here, Grinnell. Tweet it out. Tweet the poll out or something. He's like a baseball player from the Dominican Republic. You mentioned Bedard's shot. We had uh, Shane Doan on, and he was raving about yours and how deceptive it is and how, like, you know, I think, what did he say? He, like, grits his teeth and he curls his toes to get his shot off as hard as he used to get it off. <laughs> But you just seem to do it very eloquently and using the technology to stick. Where did you learn all that? Like, how did you adapt and and just kind of go into that? I practiced a lot. Like in the basement, I uh, I practiced uh, a ton, like countless hours down. There. I, I still do. Like when I'm at home, you know, my brother and I we we're we're down there for for hours. And I don't know. I think just the technology, the sticks are whippier now, so you can kind of just let the stick do its thing and. And uh, yeah, I remember shooting with the owner in his garage there and we were snapping around for a little bit, but uh, I think just the practice of it and then the stick and Bedard, his stick is like really long. It's weird. He's got a long stick and he's got a 70 flex too. So I'm a 77, but he's got a long 70 flex stick and I try to, you could sling it with it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's nice. I'm wondering for you, I mean, you know, like you mentioned, you end the year with injury, but you come into camp, you're a high draft pick. Like, what were the expectations? Were you thinking you could make this team and or were you kind of expecting to go back to junior? Like, what was your camp experience like uh, this September? Yeah, I think uh, I definitely had some expectations on myself. I, I wanted to make the team just because, uh, you know, my junior team w wasn't very good back home either in Edmonton. And a lot of the guys had moved on and were starting their, their pro careers. So throughout the whole summer, I was... Uh, I was working hard to, to try to make that team and they wanted me to get bigger and heavier and stronger. And, you know, I, I worked really hard to put on, uh, put on weight throughout the summer and, and just try to get better throughout the camp. And, and it's a lot, it's a lot different of a game too. I had to uh, like adjust like defensively, like it in junior, if I make a, a tough play or have a, have a bad giveaway or something, I'm going out the next shift anyways. And it's different up here. And, I kind of learned to reevaluate my game like that. You can't just evaluate off, off scoring chances and uh, my offensive game, but also, uh, you know, stuff around the defensive zone. It's the little things that kind of add up and just build confidence that way. Dylan, I want to go back to the gold medal game. Um, when the checks tied it, they tied up within like a minute, less than a minute. Did you, did team tense up at all? Did someone speak up? How did you guys handle that moment of pressure there? Yeah, we, uh, we did a, a little bit. Uh, it was, it was weird. Like we kind of hemmed them in on their first goal. Like they were hemmed in for a while. Then they just went down and uh, it was kind of a weird bounce. We thought maybe it was offside. Maybe it wasn't. And then, then it went in and then our line went out the next shift. Iced the puck off the face off, couldn't get the puck out and they scored again. And it was uh, a little sense of panic, like five minutes left. It, it's, uh, you know, not ideal. You're, you're up two with 10 minutes left to go in the game and you let two in like that. So, I mean, once we got through that period and we kind of went into the intermission, it was, uh, it was behind us. I mean, we didn't talk about the structural breakdowns or anything that happened just because we knew it was three on three and it's just a way different game. And, uh, so once we got to that and a lot of the guys in the summer, they won in three on three last, last year. So they kind of knew what to expect. 
But uh, yeah, it was just a different game, and just get put that behind us and get ready for that. Did the guys like the three on three, or would they prefer the uh, five on five for a twenty minute overtime? Do you think? Uh, I think like for me, I, I think the five on five, it, it just three on three seems wrong for me. Like I, I get it in the regular season and stuff. It's super entertaining to watch, but I think at like that level at, at with like those stakes and stuff on the line it uh i i i prefer i prefer the five on five with no shootout either like i remember uh, a few years back the usb canada and the shootout after an unreal five on five 20 minute overtime went to a shootout i think terry scored and, and that was the only goal i think just the continuous five on five uh would be in my favor, but I know the three on three is pretty got, entertaining for the fans. They got the men's league after you guys. They already sold the ice. They got to get you guys out of there. They got to get you guys. He <laughs> thought watches for the MVPs and get the fuck off by eleven. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it seemed like. Hey, <laughs> another and guy. I, just I wanted to ask about is um because it was you know you and Bedard and you saw Zellweger, but this Joshua is it Wa or Roy? I mean, yeah. A late pick by the Canadians and a, and a Quebec kid, so it's exciting for the fans to have a, a kid coming up. But I didn't know much. What a player, huh? Yeah, he's unreal. He's uh, like I didn't. I never played with him before either. Like I never played with him at the under seventeen, the under eighteen. So I didn't know him until this tournament. And uh, he was really good everywhere too. Like he killed penalties and on the forecheck, like his stick was like unreal. He would disrupt pucks. It seemed like every time they would touch it. He'd get a stick on it and, and end up getting the puck. So he was a huge part of that team. He's, he was a really good player. Yeah. He was awesome. Uh, Dylan on the golden goal itself. Did your eyes kind of get wide when you realized you had an on man, on man rush there? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> they did. And the guys, uh, here, I, They've been giving it to me for the celly. Uh, like you the did last look like days. Been here you were like I didn't throw my stuff up. I, I wasn't thinking. I, uh, I just <laughs> saw the two on one and I, I scored and uh, I was happy because like it was a goal. I just completely forgot that we were in the overtime and then <laughs> Wa, Wa threw his stuff up in the air and then he grabbed me and I had my gloves off and then I, I, I saw a meme. It was like the Ricky Bobby. I don't know what to do with my hands or something. <laughs> and because uh, I just had my gloves sitting there like this and then I got them off and the guys were turned for me. But uh, in that moment, I even after like the last like, 10 minutes after when I was getting interviewed and stuff and the crowd was just going crazy. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Took one of Bedard's edibles between periods <laughs> before the three on three. It looked like you scored the winner in a preseason, a pre pre tourney <laughs> match. I was like, I actually was like, I wonder if he forgot. It turns out you did. That's hilarious. I guess I, I wasn't thinking about the Sally. Uh, the guys were saying like they were through their uh, stick and gloves in the stand or something like that. But uh, no, I, I was just thinking about the goal and completely forgot. Ask Christian Fisher what he did to me when we were in the fucking American League. This motherfucker shot the bow and arrow at me on the bench. We almost had a bench clearing brawl right after. Really? So that's probably why he wanted to see something out of you. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll ask him about that for sure. Yeah, Ghost Goss despair was there for me. He was like uh, the one all over me. So I was going to ask you, who's another guy maybe in the tournament or on your team who you, you know, when you play with guys, sometimes you gain a whole new respect for their game and you're like, holy shit, this guy's going to be a hell of a player down the road. Or maybe a guy you faced off against. Is there any names that stuck stick out to you from, from at the World Juniors? Yeah, I, I kind of want to, like, I knew a lot of the players uh, before. I, on the other teams, I don't know as much. It's kind of hard to tell. I mean, they all have the same gear on and stuff. Like, uh, it, it's hard. But uh, I thought Wall, Wall was really good. And Fantilli was another guy who uh, I'd obviously heard about a lot and him playing in the college. I, n I never played against him ever. But uh, he was really good. I mean, he he can skate like the wind. He's uh, he's fast and he was relentless. And uh yeah, I, he's a, he's a good player. So I really liked him, and he was a really good guy too. It's fun to be I, around. I, I know you mentioned the other teams. It is hard, you know. You're only playing against them quick, but you get you ninth overall, and the next year you get that Logan Cooley, and you know, being an American watching their games, that's that's a that's an up and coming studs. It's got to be exciting seeing him light it up and knowing you guys could be line mates next year. <laughs> yeah, it is, and he he was actually he was really good against us too. He scored early and. uh he has kind of an edge to this game too that that I didn't know he had, and he he plays with like a lot of emotion. You can tell he's uh, he's super competitive just the way he plays. So he was uh, he was really good against us, and uh, just he's having a good year in college too. So that'll uh, yeah that'll be exciting in the upcoming years. I'm curious, you know, you're one of those guys that really got affected your draft year with with COVID, right? I mean, so I'm wondering like. 
for a kid who's who's been a star player and dreaming about the NHL draft, was there times of like panic or not panic, but worry like, oh my God, this is going to kind of fuck with my future? Yeah, especially before the season. So we didn't get going until like February in, in my draft year. And uh, there was like talk about like, well, would I go over overseas or something? And I like talked about it, but the, the league said that they were going to get something going. So I was hopeful for that. I mean, we had a good team too, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to miss out if like we ended up going to the playoffs or something. Cause we, we had a good team. And I remember in like November to January uh, in Edmonton, the, the rinks were all closed. So all the guys are playing games and practicing with their team. And uh, we're, we're, I'm skating on the outdoor rink with like the, the guys around the city. I mean, we have good players around the city and we were fortunate to have like uh, a nice kind of rink with boards and stuff where we do development, but, I think when that was going on, uh, you know, I, I was stressing a little bit and I was itching to, to get out there and play. And uh, but I mean, it ended up working out OK. And we went going with the Oil Kings, then went to the U18s and won gold there. But uh, yeah, definitely. Dylan, I saw you bumped into uh, Sidney Crosby when Pittsburgh was in town the other night. Was that your first time meeting him? Yeah, that was the first time. Do you get a stick or anything uh, signed? Yeah, he... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, uh, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I practiced and then uh, they were coming to the rink and I couldn't manage. It's like, well, penguins are coming. If you want to meet Crosby, and I said, yeah, absolutely. So I got to meet with him, talk with him about Halifax. And, uh, I mean, pretty cool. Like we're, he's, he's the guy with the golden goal. Like he is the golden goal. He's a Canadian hero, like my favorite player growing up. But when he scored that in 2010, I'd be seven years old. So, uh, like, my my favorite player and getting to kind of share like a similar moment with him was was unbelievable. And then we went to the game last night and the equipment manager goes, uh, yeah, Crosby uh, asked for one of your sticks. I'm like, what? He, he's like, yeah, he wants you to sign a stick for him. So oh, uh, that that was like, geez, uh, he wants one of my sticks. Like, that's crazy. So that's I awesome. uh, I got a stick from him too. And uh yeah, that that's unbelievable. I couldn't believe it's stick too. It's got like a straight curve and like a weird grip on it. A hundred flex. It's short, so it's uh, it's different. Yeah. Is there a secret uh, golden goal handshake that he taught you? Uh, no handshake, <laughs> just a nice firm uh, standard one. There you go. That's that's playing it. Tommy sticks before they the touch each other's Canadian balls. <laughs> I'm not happy to hear you're playing Tommy sticks with Crosby before puck drop. Maybe <laughs> after the game, uh, Dylan. But fuck, come on, man. Yeah, I I don't know. I can't turn that one down. That's uh, <laughs> pretty cool. Like, how much of an adjustment was it? You know, Thursday you're at World Juniors, three nights later you're on an NHL sheet. Well, albeit at a college campus, but like, how, how much is the pace? Watch like your that. mouth, R.A. He, that's a dick. <laughs> he was trying to dig you there, Dylan. Don't no, buy was... into this bullshit. The Mullet Arena is the hardest place to play in the fucking league right now. Yeah, 100%. We've them. had we've had success there too, and I don't think other teams. Uh, yeah, I mean we're we're playing well on there, so they don't know what to expect. And we we have a lot of fun playing there, but uh, yeah, I was thinking, I was like, is there going to be an adjustment? And it was. I mean, there's so they're fast. That everyone's always in the right spot. The sticks are always so good, but. I think coming back, I was just trying to take that momentum and kind of confidence that I built up throughout the the tournament to bring back here and just try to play a play a similar game. And I mean, we played pretty well last night. We got into a bit of penalty trouble and and stuff, but uh, you know, we were buzzing early. We scored early, and uh, I thought we played pretty well. Oh, you've been playing awesome. As far as uh, as far as the college experience though at Mullet, you, lo- you the boys love it. You guys joke around about it in the locker room. I know early on there was some other teams complaining, but fuck them. Yeah, no, it's uh, a lot of fun, and the uh, the older guys are always telling you know me and uh, the big bad Boehner, that's what they call him, with my roommate, uh, about uh, going out after games and stuff like that right on campus. So uh, he's, I mean, we, he was just in college. He played at Boston College, so uh, no, it's a lot of fun to play, in. and it, it it's uh, we've had success there because I don't think teams know what to kind of uh, what they're coming into when they get there and it's smaller. It's like more compact. It, it's a bit young. It's a bit uh, of a younger crowd and uh, it's a lot of fun to play. in. so I, I enjoy it. Uh, I was looking up, you know, some details on you before the interview. I, I realized they still don't have your mug shot up on the NHL page uh, or the coyotes page. Bullshit. They, they, yeah. They, they did it with Michelli earlier this year. They didn't have his picture up. So I bitched about it on here and on Twitter and they finally fixed it. So whoever's listening now, 
get this kid's pitcher up, man. He's been there all season, 21 games. I, I don't know why your pitcher wouldn't be up there, man. We got to get that up for you. Uh, I don't know. Maybe a first year thing. Hopefully get her up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who, uh, who's been uh, one of the guys that you've had to lean on the most though, as far as stepping into the NHL, I know like you got some skilled forwards to play with like, uh, like Kells Schmaltz. He's really skilled. So that offensive side of your game, has that been helped develop by a few of those guys? Yeah, I think just watching them uh, in practice, too. I mean, you can learn so much in practice, like playing with and uh, against these guys and battling. And uh, the Lawson Krause is another one. Like, he's an unbelievable guy. He's really good with the younger guys. He takes us out to, to eat on the road and stuff. And uh, he's just a horse. So he's so good on the four check and getting pucks. And uh, he's got a lot of goals this year, so. Uh, you know, the older guys have been great, and we have some pretty good offensive players like Kel Smaltzy, uh, Goss Despair. He's uh, he's super skilled back there, so it's fun to watch those guys and, and get to play with them a little bit. And, and another young guy, Michelli. 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 Oh, he's on the IR. He's finished, this, though. I know. I say it like he's Italian, though. And yeah. I give it the, <laughs> I give it the, the Sopranos wrist. <laughs> Michelli. Yeah, he's, uh, he's super good. He's super shifty, like uh, deceptive with the pocket. He's an unreal playmaker. So I, I roomed with him last year uh, at, uh, like, the rookie camp and stuff when I first got drafted, so I got to know him then. And, uh, yeah, he's a good dude. It'd be, it'd be pretty sick if um, maybe end of the year you go to world championships. I don't know if that'll be an option, but that'd probably be something you'd love to do, no? I didn't even think of that, actually. But, yeah, uh, whenever you get a chance to play there. I, I actually had a buddy uh, – play there last year cylinder uh he's he's from the west too and he he said uh he had a lot of fun playing there i think i think they won silver there but uh he said he said he had a blast there and also dyson mayo from arizona he uh he played there last year and he said uh it's a pretty cool experience it's like a three-week thing it's kind of a vacation but uh, also get to play uh, hockey there i hope you were selling arizona to uh to bedard when you're at world juniors were you putting the bug in his ear that he's gonna love it here Oh yeah, I'd uh, I'd place it in there and let them know how, how much fun he'd have here and how nice the city is. I I feel like people don't know that either, like how clean it is and how nice it is and like the weather here. And uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, it's it's been unbelievable. I really like it. Fucking so nice. so just getting your opinion, um, because people have mentioned like, oh, what's it gonna be like that first year, like. Can you see like a 40 goal, 80 point rookie year for him next year? Uh, yeah, I, I, I know it sounds crazy, asked, but I don't know. Like it's, it's so hard. Like yeah. I, I think so though, like how good he is offensively. And I remember after the Slovakia game when he danced those guys and scored in overtime, I was talking with Brian Clark and he's uh, up with LA and I was asking him, I was like, yo, like how many do you think like, like he could get right now? And he's like, well, like, I mean, if he plays like first line minutes and on the power play and stuff, like, he's probably he could probably put up a point a game. So, I uh, I think so. Yeah, and I'm excited to kind of see it next year. Hey, tell the boys fucking let a few soft ones in if you guys are in the lead moving <laughs> forward here. Come on, Gun. Hey, uh, hey, none of that. Coyotes work hard, but tank for Bedard. That's the say. <laughs> that should be the new mantra in the locker room. I'll get the t-shirts printed. Grinelli, help me out with those. <laughs> Let's fucking lock this kid in, Gunther. We're going to have a long run here. We're going to get the new arena. It's going to be a blast. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd love to play with him. So I uh, was planting the seeds in his ear, and, uh, you know, he better be excited. Start missing the net then. Fuck. <laughs> he seems like a pretty outgoing guy. Like, he's got some personality to him from, from what we've seen, huh? Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, he's good. I mean, like I said, he's a really good guy off the ice, and uh, – He's super modest too. I think that goes a long way. Like, like when you come back in the room and uh, you're watching the highlights and they're talking about him and stuff, like he's not, he's not talking about himself or saying, you know, look, look at me here. I think he's, he's really modest about that. And it, it really helps, uh, you know, kind of internally in the morale on the team when you have a guy that good and who's getting, uh, you know, that much uh, attention who's, uh, you know, really, really good about it. Well, we, we can't thank you enough. And honestly, in watching you play earlier this year, you had a, a crazy long career ahead of you, super skilled. So we appreciate it. And, and congratulations on the gold medal, man. That's awesome. No, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so much for uh, having me on. I uh, couldn't be happier when you texted me, Viz. That was, that was awesome. I'll never forget that. So thank you. Buddy, the pleasure is all, all ours. And uh, if the guys in the locker room are giving you a hard time about the celly, just fucking send them my way. Especially if it's Fisher, I'll bop him on the head, that fucker. Yeah, yeah I'll let him know tomorrow. Tell him, the, tell, tell him to put away the bow and arrow. Put away the bow and arrow. I haven't seen the bow and arrow yet, but okay. I'll, I'll send you the clip.
Okay. Awesome. See you, buddy. Thank, thanks a bunch. Dylan, congrats, thanks, guys. man. Thanks. Congrats time. again, pal. Great job the other night. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate Keep it. Keep ripping it off, dude. Great Keep meeting going, you. Buddy. Thanks. Go yo. See you guys. Huge thanks to Dylan for jumping on with us, man. He had a very busy week, so he made some time for us, and we appreciate it very much. Of course, Biz, you had a big hand in getting him there. Uh, Biz, you had a big hand in a scene the other night. I mean, I don't know if it's viral or what a viral level is, Another but you asked, you, you asked to do the gritty, and um, I don't know. What, what, what exactly did you, did you do? Oh, okay. I thought you were mentioning the Larkin thing. We're going to go to the gritty first. I don't know how to do the fucking gritty. I know that Grinnell probably knows how to do that dance. Every every kid under a certain age does it all over TikTok, and they put me on the spot. I remember seeing Ian Schefter. Was it Ian Schefter who did it on the, the Adam the Schefter? Field? Adam Schefter, Ian, yeah. fucking, I'm out to lunch. Well, wait, you uh, were right. You were right last week when you said Justin Jeffries created that. Jefferson created that. The uh, uh, LSU wide receiver from the Vikings. He's the guy who created that. You were I right. I, was, well, I don't ever remember popular. seeing it prior to him doing it when it was at LSU. And the, LSU had another stud receiver. Oh, Chase. Yeah, I think they it both was those doing two. it that year with Burrow. And that was kind of the first I, I heard of it. Biz, yours wasn't too bad. I thought it was decent. I, my 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 sack was like hitting up against my uh, my dress pants. I think it's gotten a little bit heavier since everything that whole ordeal happened. Although we're we're almost back to normal, so uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I I definitely let the gritty crowd down. You you definitely got that on audio too because I heard you talking about your sack uh, when we were sitting down the night. Like, did he just say something about his sack? I'm like, yeah, this this probably did talk about his sack during the time. yeah late late night TNT cable. gets a little bit greasy. Yeah, I mean, it was good stuff either way. But uh, before the Wings-Devils game, by the way, the Devils pounded the Wings 5-1. to one. You had your big J journal hat on uh, interviewing Dylan Locker. What do you say we fire that audio up there, G? <laughs> now we'll go with the serious stuff. Do you, yeah. think, do you think you still have a Red Wings jersey on next year? I know you guys are on con- in contract negotiations going back and forth, but uh, how are things proceeding, and uh, do you think that uh, you guys are going to meet somewhere? Uh, I sure hope so. Um, you know, <laughs> i got a game to play, and... And uh, 15 minutes right now, I'm just, uh, you know, excited to be wearing a jersey playing in the in the NHL tonight. And, uh, uh, yeah, um, you know, I hope it, uh, that I'm here. Dylan, um, just tell him it's none of his business. Just tell him it's none of his business. Don't worry, it's none of his business. Yeah. <laughs> you can, I don't even know what to say. If Biz. your PR guy wants to answer it, you can hand over the headset to him. <laughs> yeah. Dylan, so don't worry. Permission. I got permission to leave? Yes. 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 Right. See, yes. See you guys. Yeah. Biz. I'm not gonna lie, Wade. Well, I don't like do, wait, wait, wait. I don't like doing the pregame interviews because, like, I don't really fucking give a fuck about the four check. I don't want to. I go. I get to ask the captain of the Red Wings one question. All that's being talked about is the, the contract negotiation between his side and Stevie Y, and apparently Stevie Y ain't budging. That's what what's being said, right? He thinks he knows exactly what this person's worth and bringing him back, and it's being offered, and he ain't moving. I said, I want to know what the fuck is, is going on. I want to know what's going on with the Detroit Red Wings captain. And I bet you a lot of the fan base wants to know what the fuck's going on with the Detroit Red Wings captain. So I asked him and he was fucking pissed. And he looked at the PR guy and then the PR guy didn't have anything to say. And then it was awkward as shit. And then I said, does the PR guy want to answer the question? And I had so many Detroit Red Wings fans, you classless hack asking him that 15 minutes before puck drop. Da, 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 da. Fuck you. If he can't handle that mentally, me asking about his contract 15 minutes before puck drop, come on. Guy's going to sign for over 50 million bucks. He can handle a, a, a little bit of a difficult question. And that was a softball for him to say, I'm confident that things are going to get done. I want to be the fucking captain of this team, and, and we're going to get it done, and I'm going to be the leader of the squad. But I'll hand it over to you. What did you think? Would you have been pissed if I asked you that? I, I just... <laughs> I just would have been so shocked. And and for some reason, I don't know, when I saw the clip, I was out to lunch. I was like, I thought it was post game. When I when I when I re- actually realized it was before the game, I mean, I'm not a question shamer. Qu- asking questions, and I've never don't done you it on TV like you fucking shame it, my question. It's so hard. That was the worst fucking question pregame I've ever heard. Like, I can't believe you. Bro. Like, I the, there was no other reaction Fuck to give He's you. Like, and for for him to say, oh, I got a game in 50 minutes. <laughs> like, I bet you even talk was like, what the fuck? It's like, it, it's it's just it's just so funny to think like that that's what you came up with. And and granted, I'm not question shaming while also seriously question shaming you. But I mean, never in a million years did that kid expect to get asked to put his I fucking deal after jammed warm-ups. Him up. 
I came one-on-one -on -one, McDavid down the wing, fucking crossing over. What, where's he going? Where's he going? You don't know, bitch. Fucking oh, between your legs. If I want motherfucker, his, his reaction, like the way he looked over, he's like, what the fuck? He's like, bit. he's like, like if he could have hey, swore, he's oh, like, okay. Biz, are you fucking kidding me right now? Yeah, yeah. So okay, so all right. Well, he probably hates my guts. I I, I love Larkin. Fuck, he sent me like I asked him for uh, restaurant recommendations one time, and he fucking sent a bottle of wine over. So now I feel like a fucking asshole, of course, but not really because you know we used to get to chatter about it on the podcast. But what do you imagine that? And we'll get back to the question shaming and RA. Maybe your opinion on whether it was a good or bad. RA question. texted me. That's the worst question I've ever seen. He was dogging you. RA is. Who are you going to believe here? All right. You're going to believe him. I, I, I haven't heard you speak, so I don't know. Is, is he lying to me? I'm lying. I'm lying. Okay. Fuck yeah. you. I'll ask you. Fine. Fuck you. I'm going to send it over to R.A. for this question. R.A., I can't imagine that Stevie Y is offering their camp anything less than seven and a half million dollars a year. Like, I think that that would probably be in, insulting. I would imagine the number, the comfortable number of any, any Detroit fan listening would probably assume like an eight times eight. What do you not to, not what the market thinks? What do you think would be being offered to him at this point? I, I wrote down eight point five is what I just wrote. I don't know if Detroit's coming in that high, but I think that's probably where he is. I mean, he's less than a point per game player. He had a great season last year. Um, I mean, if he wants to be there, he wants to commit, stay the captain of this huge legendary franchise, then, you know, I think he can come to a deal. I think he's going to get about eight and a half. They'll probably fight over it a little bit, but, you know, you look at the dollars going up. You look at what Goodrow got, not that they're the same type of player, but you look around, man, he's got to probably get at least eight and a half. No, you look at Barzell. I think Barzell's 9.25. who's also a year younger. I don't know if he's that type player. Um, I don't think he's that dynamic, but you know, last year was huge. This year, he's kind of keeping up that same pace. I think, I think if the if if the Wings lock that up at eight years for sixty seven million, right, whatever, eight point five. I, I think that's a, I think that's a very I, I, fair deal for both sides. I don't, I don't think that that's what what Stevie Y would probably. No, I think offer he's probably him. offering eight times like six point seven five. No, not I. If it's that low, then I'm on Larkin's side. I so the what I talked to G about as I compared it, we were talking on the phone. I said, I want to talk about this because we've talked about Bor Horvat. If this guy doesn't sign a contract before the trade deadline, Stevie Y is moving that asset and looking towards the future. Yes, oh, maybe you think bro, he's I think so. He's got a no, I don't know, he, man. It's tough trading he, your young captain. He's got a no. Sorry to interrupt. He's got a no trade clause, so he doesn't go anywhere unless he fucking absolutely wants to. He has Larkin just has this, a no trade clause what? just for this, this just for this year and the contract. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I don't, have I don't know. No. I couldn't see yeah. that, Biz. I think this is one of those. Yeah. If you lose him, you lose him in the summer. But yeah. Wow, I didn't he, know that. Yeah, five year deal. He only had it in the last year of the deal. Um, probably for this type of exact scenario, I suppose. But he doesn't go anywhere unless he wants to. I mean, the, I mean, the, like, the fact he, that the cap isn't really going to be going up that hurts him a little bit. Uh, I, I put it this way. I would be shocked, busy boy, if next year opening night he's not on the Red Wings. I'd be shocked. I'm shocked. I'm shocked that he wouldn't waive it to like it because obviously the, the it would be going to a contender or somebody who needs his services now, right? I just I look at the Landeskog contract where Landeskog, I would say very similar comparison. And Landeskog, his only issue lately over the last couple of years is maybe staying healthy for the full schedule, right? But based on like a point production standpoint, I, I want to say he's even like a little bit more than Larkin. And I get that it's a year later, but as far as money, I mean, guy won a Stanley Cup as a leader of the fucking Colorado Avalanche. And I think that he's probably a little bit more advanced in the number category because of uh, guys surrounding him. So that's where I kind of leveled it off is like the same type of intangibles where he got eight times seven. So advanced the year, I think that the number that that Detroit might be staying firm at is probably 7.5. I can and that's see that, where, I and, and that's where I landed. And, and to hear that he's got the no trade clause, I never looked at that. And I, I, I mean, obviously, I'm not a fucking like I'm not Elliot Friedman. I'm not any of these guys where I fucking know even where to go for that. But. You don't think that he would be traded to a contender if, if they can't come on an agreement? Wouldn't that benefit him from a going to free agency and getting what he wants standpoint? Possibly money-wise, but in terms of being from Detroit and being the captain and looking at maybe the future of this team being super bright, I would think he'd really want to be there. We'll yeah, see. It's like interesting. I mean, Detroit's struggling too right now. I think or, it was yeah. a little... 
they they ain't gonna make playoffs. No. And like I don't want to say sophomore slump for cider. It's just lugging those minutes against all those top end guys all the time. And you know, him and him and Sherrod are playing together. I think they've played quite a bit of the season together and like they're getting chewed up a little bit. Like it's it's it, it's tough sledding with the lack of depth they have there, and all of a sudden this kid in his second year is getting put in every single situation. He'll learn and grow from it. We know that, but uh, yeah, they're 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 a ways away, and they put up a pretty good fight in the meantime. But yeah, they're not a playoff team. Guys, there's also not a ton of young centers on the free agency market this summer. Jonathan Taze, Ryan O'Reilly, Sean Monahan, Jordan Stahl, Bo Horvat. Joe Pavelski, those are some of the names who will be free agents, but Larkin seems Pavelski to be the resigned. youngest. Pavelski got a yeah. Pavelski extension. just resigned. I'm sorry, but other than that, not many names in the market there. All right, well, he yeah, definitely so he, make more money if he goes. Yes. If he goes to UFA, he's going to make more dough. It's all about you know. Do you want to be there? Do you want to be a part of this? And he's the captain, and he's from Michigan. Exactly, he's in his eighth year. He's only been to the playoff once, but it's not like this team that's been floundering. I mean, they've been working on something. They're getting there. The pieces and pots are there. So again, like you said, what, does, does he does he want to be with Detroit? I think that's where he wants to be. The hometown. Why wouldn't he? I don't know. I would say we get him on and ask him, but that ain't happening. <laughs> no. We, 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 yeah, we yeah. watched that. We'll have to put him in the thing that chair from Clockwork Orange when they like hold his eyes open, like, oh, hey, your next interview with Biz. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see Clockwork Orange, Biz? I never, I never saw it in its entirety. I've seen bits and okay. pieces of it. Oh, that's the second. Um, all right. Yeah. So, uh, all right. But honest, honest yeah. answer. Were you, uh, were you surprised at the question? Were you like, uh, if, if, a, 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 if Jack Edwards had asked uh, like that to Brad Marshall, would you have been like, oh my god? Probably, yeah, because it's local, regional. I, I was surprised, Biz, only in a good way though, because like you know, sometimes like I've done on the show here, we're kind of having softballs or whatever, and I'll come out and kind of put someone on the spot a little bit. I think it kind of refocuses, refocuses it, and they're like, oh shit, I got, I got to answer this really here, and because you could kind of see his wheels turning. I thought it was great, man. You know, I would say you put him on the spot. He probably gets asked that all the time, and you know, whatever cliches those guys usually come up. But I thought it was great, great TV. Uh, and if I could do it again, man, like I say, people can shame Fucking questions. Right. You, right. It's what happens after it's what gets said after it's like, you know, it could be a dopey question, but if the fucking answer is grade A, then, well, that doesn't happen without the quote unquote shitty question. So fucking keep, keep at it, buddy. That's you right. It. That's what I Absolutely. thought. Fuck big wit. That big J, you. I appreciate Let's smoke that, that. big J the advice. Big Thank J you. on the hat. <laughs> Sounds like a couple guys who ask bad questions, but that's <laughs> yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, um, so anyways, we were down uh, Newark because that's uh, the Devils beat up the Red Wings that night. We were down Newark about a month ago. Since we left, the Devils went 0-7-1. and They finally won Saturday when they beat the Rangers in OT. Pasha was all over us, but this Jack Hughes, man, absolutely carrying this team right now. 26 goals, 23 assists in 40 games on pace for 53 goals, 101 points. Uh, this team, man, put, uh, wait, go to you first. I knew you were You might lose a there. bet over this. Yeah, that's a tough bet. That was a that was a bad bet by me. And I seem to uh, or I like to have pride and be able to kind of figure out some good odds with people. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. I I, I knew he was super talented. I, I kind of was betting that he'd have a tough time staying healthy all of those years <laughs> because of the injuries he'd had in the past Jesus. and him being a little. Well, I, I don't root for that at all. But in the end, like my bet that he wasn't going to get 100 points in the next three years could turn out to be one of the worst bets I've ever made in my life. Because right now he's on points on pace for over 100 this year. And then he still has two more years if something were to happen. And he gets a little cold. So he's that's a loss. That's going to be a payment to Pasha. Pasha um, should get to paddle you if he goes the full three years every year, 100 points. Just bend you over like uh, dazed and confused. Who is the guy? Who is the uh, Ben Affleck has the oh, one that yeah. says fa you. <laughs> That's a bad one. Beats on the pitcher who keeps rubbing his freaking nose all, all movie. I hate that guy. But uh <laughs> it, it it's weird because that start was so so special. And and it was like, holy shit, like this devil's team's for real. And then things came back to earth. And I think most devil's fans would agree that that they didn't even see a run like that coming. I think they thought they'd really compete for a playoff spot this year, but that was like, oh my god, expectations were just immediately brought a little bit higher. In the end, I think they kind of came back to who they are. Now, they still sit second in the, in the Metro, so the season's still been, been going great. But if they needed that win. They needed that win. And, and leave it up to the Rangers to get them that win. Holy fuck. What a collapse. Now, I should shout out to Shesterkin because most of that game, it was insane. Like, they were out shooting them two to one, which is kind of the, the devil's matcher, right? We out shoot everyone. We're dominating. We're just losing every game at home. And then, boom, Hughes took over. He had two beauties. Um, 
Th- that team, though, I still don't think, and I think Jersey's in the playoffs. I, I really do. I think they're going to get in. But I think they lose first round, and that's not dogging them. I think it's going to be a bright future. I just I don't see that team built to win now, so I understood how they had that little run and that little hiccup at home these past few weeks. But it's just like their defense and their goaltending. I don't, I don't know. I don't see like a team that can compete in a seven-game series when we get to the spring. But still, it was nice to see them come back and smack the Rangers in the mouth. Yeah, I'm so invested in their roller coaster ride, like whether they're going to make playoffs or not. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna enjoy the moment in that ride, and hopefully, Ribbon Pasha in the end. Uh, the the one they had in the TNT broadcast was the big win they had against Detroit, and then that next game, RA, we had they had uh, fucking Caprice off, man. Are we done on the New Jersey chatter? By the way, RA, did you have anything well, to say? We had the other the other game first, the, the second half of the TNT doubleheader yeah. to them Buffalo. So yeah, Minnesota beat up on Tampa five to one on that game. By the way, you had that uh, interview with Jake Middleton between periods. Hilarious dude. Like, so that was at the, that was, at he the looks end like of, a comedian. Yeah, like, he is hilarious. a hilarious. No, he is a comedian. Uh, that was after the game. And I guess he's the guy who started the whole tarps off uh, post game interviews. That's why it all started with Felino and then Revo. And I guess he's the guy in the locker room where, you know, the certain guys who just have that little, uh, the jock and and they don't wear anything else and then they they have the ankle socks on and they fucking walk around basically in the buck and you could see their bare ass all the time he's that guy so guys give him a hard time about it and his answer is i run hot i'm always sweating i'm always hot so he likes to just walk around basically in the nude in the locker room so definitely a character shot blocking uh greasy defenseman who gets the job done and uh, he seems to be uh one of the characters in the locker room the first time I ever saw those like jocks that just hold your nuts, I, I was I remember being like, "What is that?" Like, uh, like it was always the older guys, and and I guess it makes sense with Middleton. He just looks like a vet from the '80s, right? He looks like he could have yeah. fit right in in the '80s. And guys are just, I'm like, "Is there a cup?" Or no, it just holds just, my nutsack. I'm like, "Holds oh the my nuts." God. My yeah, nuts he- are so small that I wouldn't even need the thing. But just hilarious. And they turn around and their bare asses face out. You're like, "What is that thing?" Yeah, he like looks like a type of guy. At home. I don't even know if you've heard of these things. It's just a straight up nut hugger. They don't need them. They don't fucking nuts don't drop anymore. Wit. Do, do you need hockey to, to get one of these? I can get all you got the right, saggy up. balls. Hey, all right. Hey, oh, hey, some guys wear them like even away from the rink. They just like that. The, the, the nothing. It's kind of like the uh, Calvin Klein, but even less. Gonna be fucking tripping over them at this fucking rate, man. <laughs> uh, but the reason we wanted to bring up Minnesota is they are humming right now. Wait, it's kind of a weird team. Like they're getting good goaltending from this Gustafson kid. Uh, Flurry really hasn't been his like full self all season. He still hasn't got his feet under from underneath him. Uh, he's had some tough outings, one against Buffalo, and we're gonna get to that where they lost six five. Uh, solid back end. That third line has really picked things up. Felino, Greenway, just a big heavy line. But it's still fucking crazy how they're getting it done with their two first centers. They had that Frederick uh, Goudreau and then um, and then Sam Steele. But they do have the good wings. They got Boldy and Hartman who are playing well together. And then they have Zuccarello and, and Kaprizov. So, yeah, I think that they're going to make playoffs. But are they going to be able to address the first two line centers? Like, they're, they're not going to make it out of the first round again if, if that those are their two, two guys. Like, no offense. I mean, they're doing a hell of a job. Like, being repairmen right now and filling in the gaps, but like these aren't these aren't first line centers, first or second line centers. I know, but they're run lately. I mean, they I think they were like seven, eight, and two right around then at the start of the year. Like, what's going on? And they've turned it on. And quickly, let's mention uh Fleury. He's had to leave the team for uh, some personal reasons. So everyone knows how much fans we are of him. A great guy, a great teammate. Let's let's hope that everything's okay at home. And it kind of makes sense, right? If he's maybe been struggling a little bit, who knows what he's dealing with in his personal life. So we're thinking of Mark Andre. I think he's leaving the team for a couple of days. But yeah, that Minnesota is one of those teams that I, I I put them in in the category as a really good team, not a contender though. Um. I don't want to say the same as Jersey, kind of two different makeups of teams and how they play. But I, yeah, I don't know if 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 with Minnesota's depth, they're going to be able to kind of make, kind of make a big run. Um, but they are fun to watch when they're buzzing. I mean, even that Buffalo game, I know they ended up getting the loss, but it's like Kaprizov is something else. Oh I think God. RA sent the note since he came in the league. He's fourth in goals in the entire NHL, only behind uh, 
Matthews, maybe Pasta and Ovi. Actually, Ovi, yeah. yeah, only four players have more goals than Kaprizov's 97 since he entered the league. Matthews, McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Ovechkin. And Was looking it? back now, I think his his extension is around nine. Is it nine, nine point? Half. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's a nice deal, man. That's a guy for the next eight years. Pencil him in for if he plays 82 games, 95 to 105 points. I mean, an elite level Full blown superstar in my mind. I love watching the kid play. Yeah, so they awesome. have him as a game breaker. But like you mentioned, it's like the center depth. And then, you know, and, and occasionally this season that the goaltending, it's just kind of makes me question what kind of run they could ever go on come come the spring. And in the few years when the suitor and the Parisi cap hits are off, then we really start discussing them kind of getting things rolling and being able to sign certain players. But it, it is a team right now who doesn't strike me as a true cup contender. Talk has him as a top seven player in the NHL, Kaprizov. Wow. Yeah, which which I, I, I couldn't argue with. Just his like his vision out there and like just the the, the plays that he'll make. You see the high tip goal that he had? His fucking blade was facing the defensive zone. And then sometimes where like he's coming in the zone and someone rifles a pass over, he'll just one touch it to the guy who's off to the wing. Like he just he the way his vision scans the ice and him just knowing everything and like his the way he um like the I call him the Shakira hips kind of like Makar where they get going around the, the zone open and they, up. Just, they just open them up ten and two <laughs> and he's just he's just such a fucking treat to watch so I don't know that I, I they just gotta address the first two lines and and figure out if they can at least get like one centerman in there they're kind of jammed up because of that amnesty buyout bullshit but. Definitely a fun team to watch who's humming right now. Uh, Kaprizov, too. And you'll notice this with truly great players. And I kind of lead towards Europeans, but it is it is anyone. I think Crosby, it's like when the puck's in their feet, Marshawn the same way, they're so good when the puck is in their feet. It's like, and, and I bring up Europeans, maybe playing soccer growing up, I don't know. Mainly just these guys are so skilled where you can't give them a bad, you cannot give them a bad pass. It's like no matter where you give it to them, they somehow end up bringing it up. And then when the puck is in their feet and guys are running at them, they're always able to angle their body, protect it, kick it up to their stick. And it's a true talent to be able to, like, get a pass in your feet and be able to handle it while you're moving, while you're making a play and still create offensively. So it's amazing to see, like, where he gets the puck delivered and how he still creates, like, so much offense based on a on a bad pass in, in quotes. It's like the video games. Like you just put it in his bubble and it'll just yeah. like, all of a sudden get to his stick. Wait, you just mentioned the goalies a couple of minutes ago. Well, at the Winter Classic, we obviously didn't hear it at the game, uh, but Wayne Gretzky said that you need two goalies to win in this league nowadays. And going back to Minnesota, Mark andre Fleury started 25 games. Philippe Gustafson started 16 not quite a 50-50 split, but obviously more than what you've probably seen in the past. Then, you know, Gustafson had to leave the game, actually. The biz, uh, it was the night you were on. I guess he got the turkey trots, had to run off the ice. He got sick. There was only like two minutes left on the game, too. And then, you know, Mark andre had to fill in for him. So we're seeing teams are needing two goalies like this. So, Biz, what's your take on that? Do they need them just for the regular season, or are you final one good one in the playoffs like last year? I know uh, Kemper started 16 out of the 20 games last year. Francois come in for a few, but... You know, it, it doesn't make a difference whether it's playoffs Buddy, or regular season. You, you took the words right out of my, my mouth. It's a two goalie system now. And going back last year to the finals, when Francois came in, like, I think his playoff numbers were just slightly better than Kemper's. Uh, we, you know, go back to the famous quote, stats are for losers from Wayno when I when I compared that, you know, if, if with this team, you just need average goaltending. He said it's about the timely saves, but. Yeah, they had him to lean on, man, and and uh, it matters. You can't you can't be a one goalie system anymore. Like the only one freak of nature could could argue that, and it's Vasilevsky. But he he's a fucking alien, and he doesn't he doesn't make sense. But even this year, they're leaning on Elliot a little bit to help him through this time. You know, he has he, Elliot's got a, the the net. I think he played back to back. It might have been because Vasilevsky also got a bug. But uh, you need fucking two goalies now, boys. The, the I, days I, of the Brodeurs are over. Too. And 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 yeah, I th I couldn't agree more. I will say though, when you get to the playoffs, you need somebody to kind of grab it, right? Because if yes. you're going back and forth in the playoffs, that's that's not on purpose. It's like it's big, 82 games. These guys can't do the Brodeur style. It's just a different game. There's so much speed. There's so much that goes into it. You get into this playoff, this 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 the playoffs, and you have to really have a guy grab that job. Because because if you're going back and forth and, and all marks like the Vesna front runner right now, I'd say, but like he has Swayman 
And even last year with Shosturkin, like having one of the greatest years of all time, he had Gorgiev. Well, right now, Shosturkin's not top 10 in the league in save percentage or goals against. Maybe it's maybe it's a little bit of like, all right, well, we don't really trust the, the other guy as much as we when we had Georgiev here. And that's kind of led to Shosturkin yeah. not having the same season as last year. So it's one of those things where it's like all year. Yeah, let's space it out. Let's get a guy rest. But we're looking towards making that be making that move because we need our guy to take over once the playoffs yeah. start. When you're in a playoff series and you're ever in the point where there's a guy starting game one and a different guy starting game two, and then the, the, the first guy goes back for game three, it's like, we're probably down 2 0. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, hey, it, was it, it like is Minnesota so true in the regular season, year. but it all changes come playoff time, man. Hey, and kind of like Minnesota last year, where I guess you could say there maybe was a little bit of confusion where it was like, well, is it going to be Talbot or or, or Flurry? Because they had both such success. And I want to say before Flurry got there, like Talbot was like on a on a 10 game heater, like hadn't lost in 10 games. So yeah, definitely want to have one guy as that guy for sure. You, you don't want that confusion going in. Then it just goes the 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 the, the mind games, the mental torpedoes for the coach. We do want to mention uh, Mark Andre's former teammates, the Penguins. Uh, the whole team flew to Montreal for the funeral of uh, Chris Letang's father, Claude Fouquet. Uh, he passed away last week, so uh, we certainly want to extend our deepest condolences to Chris Letang and his family and the, the whole Penguins family. Very sorry for your loss. So we just want to pass that along. He's been along. through the ringer, man. That's it, a yeah. oh. it, the team. Uh, the team's already started wearing a CF uh, decal on their helmets to to honor him. So that was, that was pretty nice what they did. So great job by the Penguins organization, just a, a very classy move. So, awesome. uh, but we just talked about the Sabres, man. Uh, Minnesota went to Buffalo at, after that game. Very entertaining Saturday night tilt that the Sabres won six, five and OT after the win. The Sabres are just four points behind the second wildcard team. Currently the Penguins with two games in hand and they got four games in hand over the ninth place Isles. Well, tie with Pittsburgh in points, man. They've won eight of nine Pittsburgh. This Uko, Pekka, Luke, Luke, Luke Honan, Luke and he's won six straight. But Rasmus Dahlin, man, unreal night the other night. 22-year-old defenseman had a career night. Two goals, three assists in 29 minutes and 25 seconds of ice. 44 points on the year in 36 games. What you're the D guy. Oh, Lisa. here we go. Wait, no, we need, we need the real analyst speaking up wait, on this. Let's hear wait, it. I mean... Oh, the, that 54 over and under I took at the beginning of the year, I smashed that over. I got a little heat for saying that. It he's looks like a get, great bet now. Yeah, I think I gave you heat right away and then looked. He had 54 last year. He's going to get 80 this year. He oh, might yeah. get 90. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, what's he have? 46 points already? 40, I think he's 44. at 44 right now. Oh, my God. What a player. And this is one of those things where, granted, the team was struggling the past few years, but people are like, and and and, and you know what? I, I, was, I was part of it. And I said, I don't know. I don't know. But whoo, whoo, it's it's been a little while. But you're now looking at a game breaker on defense. And Buffalo Sabres fans at times will say, oh, defensively, maybe gets lost in his own zone. Well, dude, Who when you're producing fuck? at a clip like this, you don't care because it's like a fourth forward. It's a rover. It's a player who's when he's on the ice, other teams are looking at a true threat. It's not like, oh, worry about that first science. Well, no, Darlene's leading the rush. He's joining on the rush as that late guy. And his vision and his skill level is so high that it's like a forward when he gets the puck. Five points the other night in a 6-5 win. He's all over the ice. I think he played over 30 minutes. He's able to play that much because his skating is just beautiful to watch. I mean, he moves out there so graceful. It's just amazing to watch him. And I think that with the confidence he's getting, and I love this quote about those beauty jerseys they're wearing, yeah. those black and reds, he says, we feel evil in them. Oh, Something so. like that. I mean, that's beautiful you right there. You think he's there in the bondage and shit? He's they've scored be six goals head, every... No? You think he's coming he's out like, with yeah, a gag I wore ball? My gag, I wore my gag ball to the rink. Um, they, I'm, I'm a hammer. He's doing the Patrick six... Line walk-ins. He's got the fucking leather straps on. He's like the gimp. Just... Um <laughs> Bring out the game. They have six goals every time they've played. It wore those jerseys. They have the most goal. Oh no, I think the Bruins last night overtook them. They're they're second in the league in goals scored. And I tweeted out, I don't know if they'll get in. I really hope they do, but but they're they're gonna be there. 10, 15 games left in the season. They won't be dead yet. They're gonna be there Did all the way. Did you see the building? How much the building was rocking? Buddy, these fans. I do you remember. I want them back? to go for it. I want them to fucking go for it and get a goalie. Well, and look start how much it. cap space they have, too. It's it's just such a cool time, and these Sabres fans, holy Lark shit. Lark into the Sabres. Lark they print the shirts. This. They Lark, wait, are you still Sabres. sticking with your guns, Wit? Do you still think Patty Kane gets dealt there? No, now Kane's injured, so I don't know what's going to happen. Um, 
So I, 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 I'm not sticking to my guns. I don't stick to my guns. On Apparently, anything. he's meeting with the Pagulas. That's just like not actually true. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, that'll be that'll man. be on Instagram he's, accounts. They're meet, they're meeting in uh, in Darlene's sex. His private there. doctors looking at his knee. <laughs> they're, um, hey, they're meet they're meeting in the in the in the in the. Oh, I I, I lost yeah. the joke. No. Uh yeah. I was, gonna say, I was gonna say the cell in in Darlene's basement. That game with the was Sibian awesome machine. though. <laughs> uh, Ryder Ryder was battling the flu this weekend. Poor kid. Oh my god. Uh, here we go Senior again. Senior kid with the sh- with the shakes when he's Book cold. The therapist the overheating. Just horrible. But he woke up and kind of stayed all day in bed. And I just put on um, I was putting on like look, the 10 minute like uh, condensed games from NHL.com. And when that game was going on, he was yelling from up in our bed. He's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because the goal is tied just, it. Oh, no, just because just watching like goal, goal, because in that yeah. 10 minutes with there being 11 goals, basically the whole thing was goals. And and it was like, holy shit, that action, man. And yeah. and Thompson's goal in that game was an a complete C, dude. That thing must have been going 100 miles an hour. Like, there's no goalie in the world that's stopping that puck. One timer from the OV spot, and I just love his is a little Sabres lower. Play. His is a little lower. It's by the dot. OV's I know, but it's usually yeah, higher. True. But he was wide. He was wide. Yeah. He was like, you want to stay inside the dots when you're shooting that? He still drifts out, and he knows he's so accurate, and he shoots it so hard. It's like, nope. Thank you. Yeah. So Dali handing those things over, he could get 80 points the next 10 years. Yeah, no, that, they call that the fadeaway jumper. That's what they're calling it in Buffalo. For I Gage like Thompson. Krebs too. That that you know the first rounder from Vegas who got dealt in the Eichel deal. He's growing. He's getting better. It's it's an exciting time to be a Sabres fan. They're my squad. They are my squad. Ari, I think you mentioned it. Five point night for Darlene. He's what second now in league uh, in defensive scoring. Uh, yeah, after Carlson, forty four points in thirty six games. And uh, going back to Tage Thompson for a sec, I guess he's like still twenty to one to win the MVP. I mean, MVP's uh, over though. You, you think what? Yeah, Con- Connor Mc, or Leon? Mc, no, yeah. McDavid's. He, it's Although yeah. they're probably going to fucking miss the playoffs. And for Christ's sake! Obviously, you never, ever, ever root for, for it. But the X factor of a, a guy who fucking gets hurt or dinged up and misses. We, it's seven, the eight second games, time you know? we've brought this up. I, this well, pod. we're we're it, doing it, away with it. We're doing I know away. without where it's but no, it, but from it a game of twenty to one. I know what you're saying. Thank you, Wood. Thank you, Wood. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's another future for this guy. Can you not talk him off the ledge for once, Wood? Like, yeah, I actually future. had I actually had Argentina to win the World Cup. <laughs> uh, it's funny. I, I did. Oh, here's I, the ticket. I, I looked up. I was like, how many do I have this year? Now, obviously, the obligatory Bruins won. Um, obligatory Senate is one. But dude, I I got Winnipeg sixty to one. I think the Island is like thirty five to one, and I got the Kings like forty to one. So King, you know. we'll get we'll get to the Kings in a bit. We actually have them on the oh, yeah. TNT broadcast coming up. And that's a team that, with a couple moves, man, I could see them going to the Western Conference Finals. It, it ain't that hard of a conference. But going back to Tage Thompson, I believe because he's still on the last year of his old deal, uh, best production based on value in the league right now, and he is just a fucking treat to watch. And, man, you're basically looking at a, 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 a guy who's elevated his game to being a top five player in the NHL. He's like a he's like a dry sidle. He's, yeah, he's, he's been like he's incredible. He's so fun to watch. And like it's not just the shot. Like there's guys you've seen before that just their one weapon is the shot and get open. And yeah, he's gonna score. It's like the hands, the passing. He gave a pass over to uh Tuck in overtime. Flurry made an unreal save, oh, too. It's like yeah, he did. he's just waiting him out. That little toe drag where Flurry's probably thinking he shoots and he slides it over to Tuck. Those two have a serious connection. Yeah, good stuff. They've been a lot of fun to watch. Averaging four goals a game. Power play clicking at 29%. Good for second in the NHL. Uh, on the other end, though, the penalty killing is at 27th at a 72.4% clip. I mean, Biz, this team has plenty of cap room. I think like $17 million. You're hearing Chikrin's name come up a lot. You think they're going to make a move here to try to get a run at the playoffs, if not necessarily the cup, just get a playoff run? Go for it. Fuck, fuck the yeah, rebuild. I, Go for it. I, I, why wouldn't I wanna, you, right? That's what they need help. Buffalo. I want to see that crowd rock, and that's the dumb move, and that's not what they're going to do, but I say fuck it. Go for it. But I would say that they they will remain patient. What you're seeing right now, God, you just said they're the second highest scoring team in the league. The minute that they get a couple better defenders – because you have a great number one offensive defenseman. I think power is going to end up being, I could see power being like, uh, like a Jay Bowmeister. I, I don't, think, I think he's going to be better offensively. You think he's okay. So there you go. So then all but of a if sudden, they go the one, one, sorry, if they go the one D on the power play, which they may, I mean, 
it's like you, you understand he may never be that 50 point guy, but in terms of 20, 24 minutes a night, yeah, I mean, this just, kid is so young still. Exactly. And then obviously getting a goaltender. And then you just talked about, oh, they're not good on the penalty kill. And all right, those types of lunch pail players, they're going to be able to plug in those holes because they do have that cap space. And the biggest, the biggest concern was Skinner. But now all of a sudden he's playing with good players. Like he's hey, is what he a nine and a half? Is is he a nine and a half, ten million player? No, but his points say that. So fuck it. Keep rolling, baby. And the cap's gonna keep going up. So they're in good shape, or that one, that one's not gonna hurt them too bad long term. So they are okay. sitting pretty. Don't go for it. Remain patient. Only thing that sucks though is you're probably not gonna get that high of a draft draft pick unless Gary rigs it again. If you uh but they've had enough. It's like uncle with the high draft picks everyone in edmonton's just punching their roof but um quick league discussion in terms of you mentioned their power play power plays are so good now and yes. i don't really know what's happened i understand that maybe in the past few years specifically it's really changed to the four forward system sometimes you even see five forwards but it's like there's 22 teams right now in the nhl with a power play better than 20 yeah. percent. that that like back when I played, like you, you had twenty percent. You're loving life. This is great, boys. This is what we need to be. Like, there's eight teams over twenty five percent power play percentage. It's like that's why you see how many guys are scoring so many goals, and it's like it's just amazing to see what teams have been able to figure out on the man advantage to continually keep them in games to get into the playoffs based on just being up a man and scoring at will. So. 22 of 32 teams to be over 20% halfway through the year. That's wild to me. We're, we were talking about that a couple weeks ago at TNT. We're like 25% is kind of the standard. Yeah. Where when we played, it was 20. Uh, definitely the four forward system. And I think it's just more uh, common now where they're okay with that first unit taking the full time. Like yep. I sometimes you see how how long McDavid and Dreisaitl stay out there where you're like, well, fucking you might as well. Well, what same else are you going to do? Yeah, same way the reason that Canada had Bedard out every other shift in the three on three in the in the in the quarterfinals against Slovakia. It's like you just keep playing your ace and and and, and the system shows that if you do, you're going to be in the 30 percent mark. So, yeah, definitely, definitely something. And as far as you mentioned, uh, I know we've been speaking a while on this shit, Darlene and how he is offensively. He's like a, the fourth guy in that cycle. And he's and he walks the line. There's probably a select few. You put like maybe the way Klingberg would walk the line, uh, Makar and Carlson, and then maybe a few others can walk it to his standard. So his offensive game is just absolutely filthy. And I know we, you know, Sharks fans, it's a, it's a tough run. It's a tough year. I watched the other night uh, against the Bruins. Eric Carlson, oh, oh my God, He's right back. now. It, it looks, it looks 10, he looks, it's like 10 years ago. It's just, uh, and, and let's hope that for the league's sake, for fan's sake, and for some contending team's fan base, let's hope there could be a deal worked out this year. I know he wants to, um, probably move on and, 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 you know, give himself a chance to win a Stanley cup, but what a fucking player he is, man. It is insane to watch him this season. I know they're out West and I know the team's struggling, but if you get a chance, it's beautiful. It's insane to watch. He just, uh, he just had a 14 game point streak that was snapped, I think by Boston. Um, this is where the argument comes in for the soft cap, where it's just a shame that there can't be any big deadline moves where a guy with that type of talent having that type of season can't get moved at the deadline. We can, we don't need to get into CBA discussions, but moving forward, I think that they should seriously take a look at making it a soft cap where fuck, there's enough teams that are worth enough. Hey, may, it, it, or at least moving it to where you're not getting punished. Uh, if, if you're drafting and developing a guy, but the fact that you can't make a big fucking deadline move anymore, unless you have somebody on long-term IR, it kind of, I don't think it does a lot for our game. Everybody's looking forward to trade deadline. Now it's just a limp dick. I think this year's going to be pretty good with Horvat, some others. I think it's going to be an exciting one. Just talking about the Mestikov no. move of the deadline. Oh, Boom. yeah. Just talking about Buffalo's power play. Well, the Washington Capitals, they're 16th in the league Ooh, with a 22.1% clip, but they should get a nice little goose this weekend. Tom Wilson come back with Nick Backstrom. Nick Backstrom had one of those hip resurfacing surgeries. I think Ed, Eddie Joe was the only one to get it before him. Uh, Wilson had an ACL tear. They're all fixed up. They come back Sunday. One not the win over Columbus. Uh, Backstrom played 14-03, three hits, one shot on goal. Willie, 14 minutes, 10 seconds, six hits, a shot on goal. Obviously, they'll ease their way back into, but this should definitely 
Definitely goose the power play. Uh, Darcy Kemp has been unreal for the last month. 7-0-3, his last 10 starts. Four shutouts, leads the NHL. Uh, right now, the Caps, five back of Carolina, though the Canes do have three games in hand. But this is a team, man. We've picked on them. A lot of expectations weren't too high for them. Now this team's like, holy shit, they're ready for Bear in the playoffs when they're already coming, man. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I never picked on them. Ryan, I would did. you like to speak? You said the Bruins were going to miss the playoffs, bro. Yeah, hey. They might break the sure, record man. for <laughs> most points all time. I'm not talking about anything else. <laughs> I was going to ask the group prior to the recording if we could do our halfway through the season uh, favorite moments so far, and yeah. mine was going to be the biz Pick the Bruins to miss the playoffs. So I won't discuss my slander of the Capitals, which has been high. And I've said they were boring and they don't get much going. And it's all about the OV goal chase. They have 40 million on the IR. I look dumb now. I I, I look dumb very often. And I like this team. And I, I do think that getting those two guys back is just a kick that they need. Not that they need, but that the team's probably so excited about. It's just, you know... As a fan of the Capitals, just be patient. It's going to take time. In terms of Backstrom surgery, I mean, Jovo came back for, I think he only played 30, 40 games after. I mean, that's a major surgery. So let's hope Backstrom's able to get back and, and become the player he was. It's going to be hard for him to do that. But you know, over time, Wilson will be right back to where he's at. So it's definitely exciting for them to play the way they had and then have those guys hop in. They actually were dominated by the Blue Jackets and still, you know, squeaked out that win Sunday, but it's going to take a little, little bit of time. That's why they're only playing 14 minutes, but I think Dylan Strom has been huge there. And, and it, it's like, he, he seems comfortable. You know, he's, he's kind of bounced around in his career after being such a high pick. And it looks like this is the spot where he's able to finally f figure out, like, I, I want to be here. So we'll see how long he ends up being a capital. It was hard for me to uh, take a, mid -post podcast piss into a water bottle and ingest everything you just said, but that was a great breakdown with. Um, I think that this is a dark horse team with Darcy Kemper getting hot and fucking, he knows the experience of being in the playoff picture. If they make the playoffs, I see them being very dangerous peaking at the right time in the season. They got Ovi chasing the goal record. So, you know, he's fucking all jacked up on Russian gas. They may, they may make a big splash in the East. If I'll say this, if I'm the Boston Bruins, I don't want to catch them first round. Not a chance. So maybe I trump your prediction of the Washington Capitals with my stupid one. I don't know. Bruins, Bruins might miss the playoffs, dude. They could they could <laughs> lose the next 40. Still get in. Still get in. No, um, but uh, it's good to see. Hey, it's good to see them healthy and, and a relevant team, especially as Ovi chases this re record in, in, a, in a serious tone. And I agree with you. Dylan strom has been huge. It, 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 you know, it, it took care of uh, the offense when they had a few of those guys out. They had 40 million on the IR at one point and getting all these guys back is huge. They got the band back together and they got some good depth players. My boy, Nikki Dowd. And Carlson's out. So, you know, then he'll come back in at some point and well, it's exciting. Whoa, yeah. Whoa, whoa. That that could be an issue at some point with the with the money. With right now, they have uh, fourteen million on LTIR between Carlson, Connor Brown, and Kyle Haglin. Uh, and if they do all come back, or even a couple, and they're gonna have to move some money money around definitely. And a name that's got thrown out there, Anthony Mantha. Uh, he was scratched on Sunday. He's got one more year, year left at five point seven million. Twenty three points in forty two games played. So they're throwing his name as possible trade bait if they do got to get cap compliant when these guys come back. So Yeah, I don't think Stevie Y was the biggest fan of him, and I think that that was part of the Vrana swap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I don't know. Like He's just one of those guys where some games he looks like such a beast out there. And I know. Good along the walls, good net front presence. He'll go on a good stretch of hockey, and then all of a sudden he just disappears. So I don't know if it's a torn motivator cuff, and they maybe that's just a little kick in the ass to get him going, put him on the trade blocks. But yeah, that could that could be a guy they can part ways with for sure, given all the other guys they got. Now, after getting these two guys back, how would the Caps not make the playoffs? Like, what would they have to do to like fuck this up? What lose? Um, <laughs> that's a great. No, that's a good breakdown. No, I, I I I don't know. I mean, I would I would think that that they'll be able to get in. Now, I would be shocked if they don't. Um, I guess the only way would be if the goaltending falls apart. You know, the power play is going to be good. That <laughs> wins teams games and. But the way Kemper now looks, it's like, I, yeah, I, I think that that's a team that's going to get in. And, and like Biz said, nobody wants to face them. It's a crazy crowd. It's a tough building to play in. And they have a bunch of veterans who've won Stanley Cups. It's like, 
it, it it'll almost be good if, if like I mentioned, if Backstrom can come back from this and even be like a, you know, a really good third line center and play power play and or even get, get back to his, his, himself. And then Wilson, you know him and, and how he plays in the playoffs. It's perfect for his game. So nobody wants to face him. And, and I think they'll get in. I don't I don't see them somehow not getting into the playoffs. I, and it's all because of this run they just went on without these guys. I think the back gets, backup goalie has been playing well too, R.A., when he had to step in when 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 Kepper was struggling a little bit there. Kepper's nevers were not numbers were never not good. It was just there was a you know few sequences of time there where you'd have a couple bad ones in a row. But the my my answer, R.A., would be if depending on how long Carlson's out, they rely heavily on their success sometimes on their power play. I think last year it ended up having a fall off year. They got to get back to having that humming power play. Uh, to to for me to make the difference, and I think that they're easily a playoff team. Yeah, I don't see them not getting in at this point, especially with uh, what those two guys bring. Uh, how about the Saturday night affair? Colorado, Edmonton, Edmonton playing so so here and there, but Colorado was down in the dumps. They lost five straight. They're down two nothing heading into the third period, not looking good. Then it, the Nate dog puts on the cape. He looked he looked like McDavid on that goal he scored to get them on the board. Then the second goal, 34-year-old veteran defenseman Brad Hunt, first one of the year, great timing for it. And then who else? Kale McCaw, OT. He played 33 minutes and nine seconds that night, and they had seven defensemen dressed, the most he's ever played in a game. He ended it. He's got 16 game-winning goals already. He's number two on the list of defensemen within their first four seasons getting game winners. Uh, the most time on ice by an av- avalanche player since Adam Foote way back in 2003. And he's played. he's cracked 30 minutes five times in like the last month. This kid just just keeps doing more and more like McDavid. Like every week, there's something else with this kid. With steroids, huh? Yeah, I mean, I I'm pretty sure he leads the league in ice time per game, which he's kind of had to with their run. And and without getting um, I don't want to say deep. It's not the right word. But that McKinnon goal is the type of goal that can actually change a season. And it's not just about the goal. It's about the fact that they came back to win. It's one of those things where your team is just dragging along and you're battling injuries and you don't have your captain. There's all these different things you're dealing with after winning the cup. And only a cup winner could tell you that th- that next year's tough, man. It, it really is. It's a grind to understand. We have 82 more. Do we get back with the chance to repeat? We can't wait till that time comes. But all of a sudden, halfway through the season, we're not even in the playoffs. And I don't think anyone's worried about them missing the playoffs. But then we're down in Edmonton and boom, what happens? One of the greatest players to ever play for your franchise and one of the top players in the league scores one of the most beautiful goals we've seen in the NHL this season. You come back from behind, you get the win in OT from your superstar defenseman, and it's like, don't look now, but a goal like that can switch an entire season around. And I know it sounds stupid. In a long year when so many different things happen, you have a comeback win against the team in the playoffs that you beat in the Western Conference Final, all based on that goal making it 2-1. That's something that just a team can just hop on, right? It's like, holy shit, he just did that. We're back in this game. We win this game. Now let's go on a run. All this first half bullshit's behind us. Let's get Landeskog back in a little while, and let's try to really go again and get into the playoffs and do this whole thing again. So as an Oilers fan, it's like, holy fuck. It's CC like just gets burned, and then Nurse is too wide, and boom. By the way, McCarr dished it quickly over to McKinnon on that goal, and then still, I think, beat both defensemen off the ice. If there was a rebound, he would have buried it anyways. So one of the goals of the year. Nothing else to say. Besides, I think you see Colorado get hot. Come up for oxygen, wet. I can't. I can't. I holy have shit. In. I am so convinced that that was a, a season change. You know what I goal. mean, Biz? I galvanizing, buddy. I was galvanizing, galvanizing. It's a galvanizing goal, a galvanizing win. I wanted to applaud you. Let's give him a little applause for that break. Not too many, not too many. But it was a it was a stunning goal, and the way that McKinnon just gallops up the ice when he's getting those cross crossovers going. Can you give it? Could you? You could have at least given us the sound effects. I actually watched right when he got the puck. I think there was four or five power crossovers to his right, and then he did one power crossover (laughs) in the neutral zone. And boom, he's gone. It's like, you, you know, I chirp CC and nurse, but it's like, I don't I don't know if there's many defensemen in the league that aren't getting split there. You just you got to understand with a guy like that. Be closer together in the middle. All right. I love the fact that you brought up Makar's ice time like that is some heavy, heavy shit um, as a fan. 
you know, given with their injuries and, you know, how they're playing catch up now, it does scare me getting burnt out a little too uh, early in the season, but at least he's got a supporting cast. Unlike the Edmonton Oilers, what, like how much did McDavid and Dreisaitl play in that one? 27, yeah, these seven, 28 minutes or something. He's jumped out at me. Uh, McDavid had an assist in 26 minutes and four seconds of ice time. Leon had two assists in 27 minutes and 25 seconds of ice time. Uh, the only Oiler to have more than them was Donnell Nurse, 28, 21. Uh, then I look back a couple more games. Uh, McDavid's last three games before that one, 24, 50, 21, 18, 23, 50. Leon, 21, 57, 23, 37, 19, 10. So, I wanted to ask, is I is Woodcroft riding these guys too much right now with these time of ice numbers? I would say yes, but what what else are you gonna do? There's exactly. there's literally no option there. Yeah. I mean Oilers yeah. fans are it's like holy shit, man. It it truly is a it's a two man team. Now if Sider and at, Larkin for Dry Sidle and McDavid, you do it. <laughs> if you're looking at uh positives, I think Kane will be a lot a ba- back a lot oh, sooner yeah. than they than they thought. And, like, talk about needing this guy back. I mean, you've seen since he's been over there. And, by the way, my jersey's on the way. But you've seen since he's get come over, like, he's a point-per-game player. You get him back in the mix. Hyman's had a great year. But, you know, he's playing with those two or one of them at all times. It's just, it's, there's zero depth. There's nothing there. And when you look at, like, this team, it's like, they're not going to win anything. Not going to win anything. I think last week I said they could get in and win the Stanley Cup. I jumped back and forth. But when you have to have these guys constantly playing 25 minutes a game, it's like, what the, what is the, what is the long game plan here? You can't just rely on two guys and over and over and over. They're dragging this entire team around. And like Biz says, like take one of them out. What are they? A bottom 10 team in the league. It's, it's nice gross. having uh it's nice having two guys like that that you could potentially trade, though, because like Jordan, Joe, Joe Thornton, when he got traded, they fucked it up. At least if they fuck up one of them, they they have the chance to not fuck up trading the other guy. That's I mean, that's a positive. That's the only way I can look at it. All right. So, so you're saying McDavid to L.A. and dry settle to Anaheim. Is that what you're saying? Busy? Maybe, maybe grow the game in the South. Gary would be licking uh, his chops. Shit. Either way, McDavid, uh, 41 games through the season. Halfway through, he's got 33 goals and 43 assists on 152 point pace. Uh, he was also the fifth fastest to 500 assists in league history uh, coming after Wayne, Mario, Peter Stastny and Bobby Orr. And dry settle, 107 power play goals already. He's already fourth in Oilers history. What you just mentioned, Evander Kane, he may well join the team before the All-Star break, so we'll keep an eye on that. And well, speaking of the All-Star break, the uh, roster's got announced between periods of the uh, what, Capitals-Blue Jackets game the other night. Let's ask Torts what he thinks. Oh. It, 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 it's, a, it's a tough league to win it, no matter who you play. Uh, so we're, we're certainly not going to uh, uh, go in the back door and say that because it's against weaker opponents. I, I think our game is, has grown as a team. John, TK has been arguably your most consistent player all year long. Are you disappointed that he didn't uh, make the All-Star team tonight? They announced oh, the team. I don't even worry about that shit. The, 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 the way they all, the whole game, the whole weekend, it, it, I don't even watch it. I, I think it's it's turned into a, well, I'll just leave it at that. I really don't care. Do you okay. think that he's deserving uh, of I All-Star? really don't care. Talk about All-Star stuff, okay? Well, I mean, all righty then. Like... <laughs> The question, the question was about Connect Me, who has been one of the few bright spots on that team. You can't take like a minute to just like, yeah, you know, he got screwed, you know, yeah, yeah, he got snubbed, or you know, yeah, TK's been been really good for us. It's just like, oh my god, the act gets so old, dude. It's so old. It, it's like, I understand you can't, you may hate the All Star Weekend, like. They asked you about one guy who's been giving every single thing you've asked all year, and there isn't a chance you could maybe pump his tires. I it, it's just the act is so old to me. It really is. Uh, I think it's I think it's hilarious. But let's uh, run through some of the names here, get some reactions. Uh, the Atlantic: Nikita Kucherov, Dylan Larkin, Mitch Mana, Nick Suzuki, Tage Thompson, Brady Kachuk, Matthew Kachuk. Linus Olmach, um, that wraps up the Atlantic. Any quick reaction? I mean, this, you can say every team has a fucking snub because there's so much talent in the league, but did any, anything jump at you there, Biz, on that first team? No, I was just absorbing Witt's comments about, about Torts, and I, and I agree with you. And the more I thought about the, the Hayes thing, it's just, yeah, I just, uh, 
the new wave of coach and the communication between player and coach is a lot healthier. I don't like a lot of the mind games and the theatrics in the media. I think after a very short period of time, it wears off. I thought that for whatever reason, it was going to be a li- even a little bit better and different this time where it seems like he's gone back the other way. You know, it seemed like he was getting a little bit better when, in Columbus. I don't know. And, and then now it's just now Philly this- to me is just, it's just the, the worst it's, in people. It's, it's the worst. It's the worst scenario in the NHL right now. I think Chicago's they're they're awful, but like, you know, you see Lucas Reichel gets like his first NHL goal the other night. It seems like, you know, the team's at least given their all. There's not much there. And and Columbus, like I said, it's 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 a tough spot. And there's so many different teams, but Arizona's played well. That's a tank team. Anaheim's not good, but they got some young talent. And then it's just Philly and Torts and what just looks like a miserable, miserable spot to be in. And let's mention Kevin Hayes because uh, he texted me about two weeks ago, maybe maybe 10 days ago and said, dude, I, you know, I made the all star game. You can't say anything yet. And I said, congrats. That's unbelievable. I was so happy for him. And then we could play the quote. He mentioned to me what he ends up saying, this quote about, you know, Jimmy Hayes and what, what he had hoped for him in his career. I, I guess, first of all, congratulations. Uh, just your, your thoughts overall on, uh, on, on getting to do this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really exciting uh, for myself and my family. Um, I, uh, I didn't see it coming, but, but uh, I'm excited and um, it's, uh, it's really important to, to myself and my brother's family and, and uh, my whole family because Ever since my brother's kind of been out of the league, his only wish is uh, to have me make the All-Star game. And literally every year he told me this, this is going to be the year. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to make this an emotional, sad type of interview. But um, when I found out, I was uh, pretty emotional about it. Uh, my parents were really, uh, really happy for me. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a really fun weekend. Just in terms of, you know, personally from a hockey standpoint, I imagine it's nice to kind of have the acknowledgement, maybe not just this season, but overall a career that's that's worthy of that kind of honor. Yeah, I mean, growing up as a kid, uh, you dream about making the NHL and, and uh, pretty unrealistic dream growing up, and then all of a sudden it happens and uh, you start having bigger dreams. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to be an all-star. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's plenty of guys in this team that are deserving for it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's... It's nice to to have that kind of with me. So it's um, yeah. I mean, it's I'm really excited. So hearing that, it's like as tough as things are going in Philly, and how Torts obviously doesn't like Kevin Hayes. He doesn't really play very much, and he and when he, when he is in the lineup, considering he got scratched and he's in the All Star game, but that's awesome, and that's something that Kevin will forever remember. And you know, just knowing that that that's what his brother hoped for him and, and that he made it happen. It's such a cool story and yeah. so happy for that entire family. Well said, Whit. And we're going to get to be there. We're going to be there with him. Oh, yep. oh boy, that's going to be wild. You're going to have uh, Hazy, Hazy down there, plus the Kachuk boys are going to be down there. By the way, congrats to Keith and Chantel uh, on your boys, both your boys making the same team. That's going to be cool as hell, but there's going to be a lot of mass holes tearing it up down there. Uh, we know that's going to happen. Plus, uh, oh, well, we'll get to him in a minute. One more Massachusetts guy, but first, the rest of the Metro Sid B. Crosby, thanks, Sid. Johnny Gaudreau, Hazy, as we just mentioned. Jack Hughes, Brock Nelson, Alexander Ovechkin, Igor Shesterkin, and Andre Svechnikov. <laughs> oh, I can't do all that. Wake my He's day, never Rob. make that noise again. Happy for no. Brock Nelson. Great two-way center. He's had an awesome year. Um, that was kind of a guy who jumped out to me, like, deserving of it. And, you know, it's 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 been a really good career for him, kind of quietly, too. And so that's that's something that just when things are over 15 years down the line, you looked, I was an NHL all star. Was that the guy we thought had 200 games played? No, that was Bailey. Oh, I Bailey, thought. Yeah, okay. I thought it was his third year in the league. He had like <laughs> 1200 games. Ah, shit. Uh, let's see the central Clayton Keller, Seth Jones, Kale McCaw, Jason Robinson, Kirill Kaprizov, UC Saros, Vladimir Tarasenko, Josh Morrissey. Uh, nice to see a couple new names in there. Marcy, I don't think he's been there before. Robo, obviously, great to see him there. Kel McCaw, no brainer. Gee, let's go to you for a little reaction here, big guy. Uh, I was a bit shocked to see Vladimir Tarasenko on there. Just, th- just in the sense, like he's probably getting traded out of St. Louis. You know, things haven't gone as great as he wanted. 
I don't know. I was just a little shocked to see him on there. Yeah, you always figure some big names are going to get left out one way or the other. Uh, it is and weird the- to see, you know, he's fifth in scoring on the Blues. Kairou's turned it on big time since a little slump early. I, I know Kairou was, was Kairou there last year? Yes, he won the yeah, fastest he won the fastest skater. skater. Yeah. yeah, we yes. saw him at Hakkasan after. He called it. He called his shot. Yep, forgot. He goes, I'm going to pay for this bottle to service out. tomorrow night. I'm going to win that fastest skater. And then blew the 50k at the club. They should have. They should do a, a new goalie skill. Like get Jordan Bennett in there and another goalie, and just let, have a goalie bump. So when goalies are past each other, who, who can knock each other over? Because the fucking way Bennett like a, like the fights. movie A Knight's Tale when they would do the jousting, <laughs> little goalie. joust. Yeah, yeah. Get some Bennett joust going. Well, like they're the actually, XFL. Remember the XFL? They'd race the center to get the ball to see who started with it. No, oh, I don't remember that. They used to line the guys up, and it would just be a full sprint, thirty yards. Oh, that was the ball. One of the thing. I thought yeah. they had no fair catches, and that was the thing. Jesus Christ, that's just like, that's fucking nuts. Bull in the ring, as they say. Uh, I think there was talks of actually doing these like funky all star uh, skills competition things. Somebody said an alligator. I think it was Jeff, Jeff Merrick and Elliot. Jeff Freeman. Merrick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go, go. You got the run down there. Yeah, he Merrick, he said they they're ta- talking about incorporating alligators into it in some form. And he's like, he said like round meat. He goes, well, I guess they just call them hamburgers. So they're gonna shoot like meat sized pucks or meat shaped pucks or whatever, and uh shoot them to the alligator to feed the alligators. That was one thing he mentioned. So uh we were talking like what other what other Florida skills uh could you wit incorporate into like the skills competition with taking taking into account the way you, what state you're in? Who can do the most meth and then drive on a car that isn't registered. <laughs> hey, how about uh, how about this one? Uh, Johnny Goudreau jet ski competition. <laughs> get Kalorn there. Boat Kalorn and get a jet ski race going. The you know, professional doc talker. You you got one all right? Like waffle, like, do like Waffle House, like Contra, like mix, like you have to fight your way like out of a fucking Waffle House at like four in the morning. Dude, those fucking, that staff throws hands. Did you see that video? The, the girl caught the chair they threw at and she buckled that girl at about Is this based on cuts. one viral video? Like there hasn't been, or, or oh, is this a, a regular no. occurrence? Oh, no. Florida no, Waffle, Waffle House, House has waffle. brawls. Dude. Oh, Waffle dude. House. You have to like yeah. have fought in UFC to work there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the customers they, they misbehave, and then they, you know, it, they most of the time it's the customers fuck around and find out because it's not like the staff's picking fights, but they're well equipped to handle it. Uh, how about how how many with the most rides you could hit at Disney World in a day without a fast pass? Two. That's more violent than Waffle House <laughs> with all those crazy parents. Hey, well, now going true. back to Waffle House, man. Like, uh, like. like I haven't seen many of these videos about specific Waffle Houses. I mean, what's the I've one that you're talking about? Waffle House. Oh, what? Oh, wow. You're missing out. That's why Love I've them. been to a bunch of them, and there's never been any type of violence. Seems like good? a like is it? Is oh, it's, it's, a, it's like it's, a solid it, diner. Yeah, it's it's probably a notch below a solid diner, I would say, but it's certainly good. It does the trick, you know. If you're traveling or you just need a late night fucking eat, I've never so had kinda, a bad kinda, meal. You'd say, like my Waffle House, what comes into my brain is tin cup. When I think they celebrate there after his really low round on like Friday or something, and then his girl comes in and it just looked like pretty disgusting in the movie. I feel like they show, you know, if you get a waffle or pancakes there, there's, you know, there's a pound of butter on top of it. It's just one of those. Oh, yeah. It's when you're, when you're drunk, just probably the spot. Actually, it's funny you mentioned Tin Cup uh, when I think they're trying to incorporate a hockey golf thing on the ice to just spice up the all star skills, because I think the the the. NHL All-Star game, it's definitely losing a little bit of steam, so they've got to find ways to revamp it, and they have tried. They've tried for many years, and uh, all right, I know we've been long on the the All-Star talk. I think you still have to talk about the Pacific. Absolutely. I mentioned one more Massachusetts guy. Congrats to Matty Bedez. He's a rookie this year. Might win Rookie of the Year as well. He made the All-Star team, so big shout-out to him. Uh, Kevin Fiala, Nazem Kadri, Eric Carlson, Connor McDavid, Elias Petterson. And Troy Terry and Logan Thompson. So again, a, a lot of new names on there. Guys getting their first crack at it. I'm sure it's pretty good to the first first time All Stars. With I'm not being a dick, did you play in an All Star game? I'm not. No, like, I didn't. But I would okay. have made it, and then I got hurt. Okay. Yeah, NHL. Sure for, yeah, dude. That year that I blew out my ankle, like the real end in Edmonton. I was gonna make it. I think I had right around a near a point per game at the time, not a point per game. I'm going to check right now. Uh, I think the one good 35 prediction. games, I had 27 points. Ooh, I, I, that's a great start. I, I think I was going to make it that year. At least I tell myself that. 
I'd say but the no, one I good. I played in a Young Stars game already. You remember when they had the Young Stars game? Yes, I do. Yeah, Dallas. Um, so that was a lot of fun, actually, getting to be around, like, obviously the regular All-Stars. That's when I s- had to sit on the toilet on Mario's plane. <laughs> uh, I'd say the one good prediction I had uh, before the season started was Logan Thompson, seventh best goalie in the National Hockey League. He's well on his way, man. He fucking might win the Vesna if he has a good back half for crying out loud. Undrafted, yeah. folks. Canadian boy. Good Canadian boy. I was looking at numbers today. It's weird. Vegas, Vegas is like 500 at home. They're lighting it up on the road. That that home ice advantage. It's kind of surprising to see how well they've played, and they're not even really doing that great in their in their building. Yeah, teams must have smartened up about the Vegas flu. You know what I mean? Well, they stay 40 minutes off the strip now. They got them staying in fucking Scottsdale, (laughs) which probably ain't any better. Better actually, they they make them stay in the the middle of the desert. Well, the audio is probably too long to play, but very cool moment for Troy Terry when he found out he was an all star. They brought him Troy Aikman via video who he's named after. And it was a great little speech he gave to him, uh, Troy. It wasn't just obligatory. Hey, congratulations. He had some nice words. It was words. a cameo. Yeah. <laughs> 20 bucks. Uh, but you could tell uh, Terry was visibly moved, right? When you could tell it like really meant something to him. I just got a kick because after we talked to him, you realize he's a funny kid, right? And he's like, oh, Troy, when he came on the screen. He's like, is he, is he talking to me? It was just like a kind of like a goopy response. But yeah, I didn't even I actually forgot that he was named after Troy Aikman. So it's pretty cool. And Troy Aikman, by the way, what a stud Um, guy. He's got to be on testosterone or something. He looks insane. He looks incredible. And for all the concussions the guy had, he just looks like he's all ripped up. He had the Monday Night Football microphone, which made it look even cooler, you know, being that big of a broadcaster. So that was one of the most original ways I've ever seen a guy find out that he was uh, a participant in the All-Star game. Yeah, definitely something different. Uh, do you ever see that picture of Troy Aikman with Jay-Z? They say he looks like a white Jay-Z. They do look They do look yeah. a lot alike. Yeah, it's kind of funny. When you don't, not something you think about when you look at it. You're like, oh, I think they nailed that one. All right, so for the final 12 players, uh, there'll be two skaters and one goalie from each division. The NHL is going to have fans vote online, and then they're going to combine those votes with some sort of Twitter data. Uh, those 12 players are expected to be revealed on January 19th. Of course, All Star Weekend is down Sunrise, Florida, February third and fourth. We should oh, yeah. get a, a podcast dark horse who we have all our fans vote for. What about Middleton because of his interview? Oh, oh yeah, we, we didn't mention a- that biz. He called his teammate a piece of shit right on the fucking air, and you have yeah. to pay his. Well, fine. yeah, let's actually let's roll that. You know, we were talking about this group, just how how tight it is. You know, we spoke to Ryan Reeves. And he talks about you know the chemistry on the ice, but also in the locker room, uh, how this is a tight knit group. And Billy Guerin has said that he likes character people and he likes characters. <laughs> and I feel like that is you. How much does this team allow everyone to be themselves? Oh, it's unbelievable. You, you see it with everyone. Like, we got a guy like Rebo coming in. Johnny Merrill's got a mullet and a little mustache and missing teeth. <laughs> Bartsy's kind of a piece of shit out there. It's all just everyone can be their own person, and it, it's unbelievable. <laughs> got a biz it's moment. Yeah, right there. It's a family show. Hours, right? You just had a biz moment. It's a family show. I'll pay your fine. <laughs> there you go. That's a reason to vote for him. Fuck it. Get him in the All-Star game. Absolutely. Get him in. Uh, hey, and, hey po- and he'll do the breakaway cop with no tarp on. He'll go nipples <laughs> out. Put some spit and chicklets nipple clamps on him as part of the crew. Maybe get the... The pink Whitney, uh, the droopers. Darlene has a spit and chicklets whip for his. Yeah, pink, pink Whitney nips on his nips. Uh, tuck those eggs away. Uh, and finally, the coaches. Uh, Rod Brindamore is going to coach the Metropolitan. Bruce Cassidy will coach the Pacific. Interestingly, this is uh, the fourth time in five years that Vegas coaches coach the Pacific. Uh, we won't find out about the Central coaches until tonight's games conclude because Dallas uh, it's either going to be Pete DeBoer from Dallas or Winnipeg's Rick Bonus. Uh, and then the Atlantic, his very first time participating in an All-Star game. Bruins head coach, Jim Montgomery. And boys, I don't think we even told the listeners who we had today, so I think we should probably send it over to them right now. This interview is brought to you by HelloFresh. You've got New Year's goals, and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your door. Looking for an easy way to eat well and save money this year? Cut back on expensive takeout and delivery and get started with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right in your own kitchen. With HelloFresh, eating well in the new year can be stress-free and delicious. With over 35 weekly recipes, they have the options you're looking for to help achieve your goals. 
Choose calorie smart and carb smart recipes, or even customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading your proteins, or adding protein to a veggie dish. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Chicklets21 and use the code Chicklets21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. That's code Chicklets21 at HelloFresh.com slash Chicklets21. Enjoy, Monty. All right, we're very happy to welcome our next guest to the show. After a stellar collegiate career at the University of Maine, where he won a national championship and was the tourney MVP, the center played professionally for 12 seasons. He then moved behind the bench, winning two clock cups in the USHL and the national championship at the University of Denver before moving up to the NHL. He's currently in his third season as an NHL head coach and first here in Boston, where his Bruins have been lighting the world on fire since the season started. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Jim Montgomery. How's it going, Monty? It's going great, guys. Thanks for having me on, and thanks for coming to the great city of Boston. Absolutely, our pleasure. It's 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 thanks to Mur, the Merman. For people who don't know, Merle's is sitting in. We're not with Biz right now, and and you guys go pretty far back at this point, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I played against Monty my rookie year. He was in Utah, and I first met you after one of the games, and you were really nice to me. You're were, you were telling me all about my game. It was one of your last years, older guy. He's already into the coaching. And I should have known he's already into the coaching. This guy's going to be a legendary coach. And uh, that always stuck with us. But then he ends up being the coach at RPI. And I swear to God, this is the best story. The whole interview maybe is we get there. We're doing the skate. I don't know if you remember this. We would skate before the hockey school. And I walk in, I haven't seen you in 15 years, I don't know, 10 years. And uh, you're getting ready, you're taping your shin pads, and you're like, hey, Merles, what's going on? You're like, you hear about the Saratoga place? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's awesome. Like, the horses are running right now. And you're like, oh, well, let's go then. And, and you took the tape off your shin guard and wanted to go right now. I'm like, no, no, we got to skate first, and then we'll head up for the afternoon. We'll go bet the ponies. Bet the ponies, but... You you showed me how to bet the ponies. Yeah. That he was showed me too, but it's something I really regret ever learning from the friggin' guy because now I never win a race. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where we, we reconnected and became great friends at RPI, and, and that was probably the start of your coaching career, basically, right? That was the start. Yeah, that was the start when I got paid the year before. I was a volunteer at Notre Dame um, and then got theirs. had four great years there, you know, started my family there. And then we moved to Dubuque. So uh, there's so many different ways because you played for such a long time and you're coaching. But I think I already mentioned before of just kind of hopping into to this year, right? Because we're here uh, for the Winter Classic. Pretty special game. You guys got to be fired up about getting to be a part of that. We're really excited, you know. Um, and I've been really amazed at this group. Um, there, it's, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. And they're so easy to coach. Um, you know, you got Bergeron, Marjan, Pasternak. As you know, and McAvoy is our four letters, um, you know, great leaders. But there's guys under them, too, that support them so well. You got Krejci, Felino, Lindholm, you know, you got Grizzlick. I mean, we have a great balance of North American and European players. And uh, the culture here, I've been blown away with how everyone treats each other the right way with respect and how everyone loves to compete. So I'm curious because if you look at the, the, the culture has been set here for so long, but Krejci was a big part of that in my mind. And, and when he left, it was tough. And when you took the job, I don't know the time frame. He had he agreed to come back. How did that all come about? When did you know he was going to be back this year? Probably after a week I had the job. Oh, no shit. That, did you talk to him? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, and it was still in its infancy, but I think it was a matter of, you know, the dollars and cents working. Yeah. And this is where he wanted to play. He wanted to finish his career. He's, I think, about 10 games away from a thousand in his career and the opportunity to come back to be around the guys I already just spoke about, and especially an opportunity to play on the same line with uh, Pasternak for a year, yeah. I think was really intriguing for him. I know a lot of pundits are talking about this being maybe a soft rebuild for the Bees this year, but what was it about the roster that intrigued you that you say, I, I got to go to this team, I got to coach these guys? Uh, it was the depth at every position. Um, and I thought the depth was good. I didn't know how good it was. I, I got to be honest that uh, the talent and um, I think what's inside every individual here was way above what I expected. Uh, you know, you got two really good goalies. Olmark's having a Vesna type season. Swayman's playing great. Um, and then the decor I thought was going to be our strength. 
uh, because you have McAvoy and then you have Lindholm and then you have such really good pieces to go with it. Two really good defensive defensemen. You got a guy that does everything, um, you know, in um, 75. I'm good with numbers. Um, Cliffy. <laughs> and uh, and then, then you have, you know, Grizzy. Grizzy can do it all, too. Like, if we need uh, someone to go in on the power play, he can go and he can run a power play. He's done it for years in this league. So I knew we were really good on the back end. Up front, I didn't know how deep we were. You know, I didn't know how good Pavel Zacho was. I didn't know how good Felino was. I didn't know how good Nosik was. Guys that really matter to being able to go wave after wave. You, you know about Bergeron. You know about Pasternak. You know about Krejci. You know, uh, DeBrusque is coming into his own. Um, I, again, I think, you know, Don Sweeney's done an incredible job putting a great uh, roster together. And I think our staff has walked into a great situation. And these guys, they play to win every game. It's it's um, it's unreal to witness that that kind of explains the come so many come from behind victories. It feels like you guys go down. It's like they're going to tie it up. But you brought up the name Felino, And I think it's for us probably one of our favorite current player interviews when we interviewed him last year. And, you know, last year was kind of a struggle for him at times. And I don't know if you talked to him and you weren't here, but what's changed with him? Because he looks quicker. He looks faster, definitely more confident. I don't know if, if, if you talked to him about over the summer. I, I know you weren't here, but he just looks fantastic this year. Yeah, we did talk over the summer, and he does look fantastic. And I thought there was three things um, that would allow him to have a lot more success this year. One was, and you guys both know this, you come off your first major surgery. Yeah. It takes a while. At that first year. year. Yeah. And, and that summer... You're just trying to get healthy. Yeah. You're not training, right, for a grind of an NHL season. Uh, two was he's get, he moving away to a new city with his family, you know, and um, we all been there the first time you get traded away, and now you're going into a new locker room and how you're going to fit in, where's your role, where, you know, all those things. And then you're going home, and uh, maybe you guys didn't go through this year in your career, but I've gone through this in my coaching career. You switch cities. It takes a while for your wife and your kids to find new friends, to get in their routine. Our routine, it's easy. We go to the rink. We've got 30 people that are friends that are talking the same language as we are. It's very easy for us. It's not easy on the family. Yeah, and I think you feel that stress probably too because even though things at the rink are good, you can tell at home it's probably like, oh, they're they're struggling to really kind of feel involved in the new city, so it makes sense. Yeah, it's in the back of your head at yeah. all times. Yeah, I want to talk about like I feel like all the guys are playing with more confidence, and I know just being around you and I was still playing your coach in RPI, you would give me confidence when I'd be skating with you. Is that something like is definitely part of your recipe for coaching is – Give these guys confidence to go out there? Yeah, you know, um, and to be honest, I think I've changed even more so to being more positive. You know, after the struggles I had, um, I've been a lot more empathetic towards, okay, how do I get someone to believe in themselves even more? Instead of harping maybe more on the mistake that just happened, I now come, they come back to the bench, and when I let them, you know... <laughs> relax a little bit and then they end up you know when it's their turn they slide in front of you again I say, wait, don't worry about what just happened let's let's think about what you're gonna do next you know like let's talk about what we can do and not what we just didn't do another guy i would have mentioned trent frederick he struggled for the last couple of years but it seems like you unlocked something in him this year what, what have you told him that he's playing so much better than he had been in previous years well i, I can't take credit for that all these guys are um, I, I always go back to the culture here. Yeah. Um, everybody supports each other. Um, but, and I think for Trent Frederick, the big thing has been, um, you know, he didn't, he had lost his confidence and to get his confidence back, he had to get it through practice and you could see him making plays in practice. Um, his training camp wasn't good. You know, and, and he knew that he wasn't happy with himself, but it took a while before he had the confidence to hang on the pucks. And, you know, once you're a player and you have the ability to hold on the puck for an extra second or two until the play develops instead of looking just to get rid of it, now your feet aren't moving. Now when you hang on the pucks, your feet are moving, you're creating space, and you feel good about your game. The more you touch the puck, the better you feel as a player. And, you know, you mentioned all Mark Vesna front runner right now, but how do you go about kind of getting both guys starts, right? Swayman's played great at times, so it's 
do you never want to go too long without one guy getting a start? Like, how will that go the rest of the season, or is it just too hard to say? Yeah, it's probably too hard to say. Yeah. But we do plan on uh, pretty much a rotation. Okay. Um, you know, Olmark's played a lot of games be just because uh, Swayman got hurt yeah. for three weeks. So that allowed us to thankfully ride him and for him to get that opportunity to be, know what it's like to go through three weeks of being a number one and playing 90% of the games. Um, you know, right now he's played incredible hockey, but Swayman gives us the opportunity to keep both of them sharp and we can win any game with either one of them in the nets. Does uh, Swayman being a main guy give any favors to? <laughs> like, well, we do, on, have, we, we do a kindred spirit there, you know. <laughs> we know what it's like to be up in Alphonse and getting uh, cheered on, especially when we're playing BC, right, What? I'll be you. I'll oh, be you. You're be you. <laughs> yeah, I knew you, you know, the, we can actually go into that because I want to get into your career with how long you played. Um, when we get to Maine, I can bring that up, but the beginning of the game for you as, as a young kid falling in love with this was your dad who got you into it what was your beginning in hockey i you know just being in canada hockey yeah. night in canada's on all the time uh my dad didn't play but he did coach coach it he played other sports he was uh he went to the olympics in boxing actually no shit yeah he didn't teach me how to fight <laughs> i wish <laughs> i was begging for a left i got hit with so many rights the times i did fight <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, he was a real good athlete. But what he instilled in me was a team first attitude and yeah. always trying to make another pass to set a teammate up. Um, I think things that inherently allowed me, I think, to always think team first and put the team ahead of any individual when I was on teams. So, you know, you, you grew up in the in the bulking age of power forwards big strong guys and you you were undersized but you lit it up wherever you went so as a youngster did you even look to the quebec league or that whole time were you like i want to go play college hockey you know i did look to the quebec league um but i was overlooked uh really yeah and uh in fairness i was five foot two at 15 you know i, I didn't i hit a growth spurt to five seven oh by the time i was 17 <laughs> You're like this could have been a lot worse. <laughs> it could have been really bad. Um, so I, I was then after a while, it's just like, oh wait a minute, I can play hockey until if I go to college at 19, I can play hockey until I'm 23. Before I got to go in the real world, yeah, I was yeah. just delaying everything. And I, I remember my dad was like, "Well, you got an opportunity to go to Middlebury Division Three. I'm like, "Dad, no rush to go there." <laughs> The Belushi plan. They do two hours of homework at night. You know, yeah, I don't want to do too that. hard of a school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Maine. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, other than Maine, what, what other schools recruited you? Was and was Maine the first one to come at you? The first one to contact me, I think, was we were not Princeton, um, and then Clarkson came on, then Maine came on. Um, I went on visits to Clarkson, Maine, and UNH, and then I was ready to make a decision. He at least could spell U and H. I'm guessing Sean Walsh, your coach down, he must have been a huge factor in you going to Maine, I assume. He was. Him and Grant Sandbrook, uh, the, the lead recruiter there at the time. Um, I think in a lot of the visits that he came and uh, saw me play, he would teach me something after every game about either puck protection or how to get better balance on the ice. Stuff I had never heard before. And I always wanted to be around people that could make you better. And, and when I went on to visit, Sean Walsh was incredible the way he commanded a room. And the, the stuff he said, um, that you would go out and watch the team play on your visit, and they would implement it. And I was like, man, it seems like the game's a lot easier. Yeah, Sean Walsh must have been actually a big part of you ended up becoming a coach, right? I'm, I'm guessing because of how dominant of a personality was. Everyone who ever met him has so many great things to say. And... And did that lead to you, like, someday knowing you wanted to get into the game and coaching when you were done playing? Yeah, because I felt he made the game easier for us. Really? Um, and he had a magnetic personality. It was, it was hard, to, uh, it's hard to explain just because I was there four years, and you guys both know, like, you, you end up being around a coach for four years. After a while, like, you know, I, you know what he's going to say. Yeah. I never knew what he was going to say. Like, he was that creative, that charismatic. So you had some great teams there, but your senior year, I mean, one of the, if not the best college hockey team ever, at least one of them, and, and Paul Carrillo was a freshman. So 
if anyone hasn't ever seen Out of the Woods, I mean, Merle, show me some of the outfits you had on in this movie. <laughs> some turtlenecks and some vests and just yeah. amazing looks. Yeah, but hair. But it was an e- yeah, you had a bunch of hair, but yeah. was ESPN. So ESPN Spaghetti fall, straps, they fall. pulling them across. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Ernie McCracken coming yeah, off the court. Big Ern. <laughs> coming off the court. But uh, ESPN followed you the whole year, right? It's like that never happened then, right? It was the first one, actually. Yeah, it did. And it, uh, I don't know exactly. I think it was Viacom. They were somehow... Okay. Uh, because we had the Ferraros that were drafted, and Viacom, I think, was with the Rangers at the time. I think that's how it all came about. Um, but it was. It was uh, really interesting, really well done. Um, and uh, I guess it was just fortuitous that we had such a dominant team that year. Yeah, I got to ask about, like, uh, the Migs told me to ask about this guy. He was the even Migs. S- He was <laughs> even smaller than you. The Cal Ingram. I eat an apple off his head. They don't have him. Everybody talks about you in Korea that year, but he scored 40 or 50 goals or something, right? Yeah. Cal was uh, five foot four on on, on a good day. (laughs) (laughs) 48 goals. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing Unreal him score that. Think somebody much. that small could play now in the NHL. Like it, it would have been, he would have had a chance. Or yeah, you know, I I think it is possible. Um, you know, with the you know, you got Johnny Gaudreau and Garland. I mean, I know they're bigger than that, but uh, the thing about Cal was he was fearless. I mean, if you ran him, you'd get speared mm-hmm. as you run him. Right in the groin, too. What do you remember about Korea? Like coming in, are you, had you heard everything, or did you see him? You're like, holy shit, like you know, the greatest freshman year of all time. I hosted him on his recruiting visit the year before and was blown away with the way he looked at the game, but I hadn't seen him on the ice yet. And the first day of practice, he did a couple of things, and I was like, this, I've never been on the ice with someone this good. You know, I always wondered, what are these superstars? How good are they? And when you get out on the ice with a Sidney Crosby and then you see it. Yeah, that like, was. Oh, OK. Yeah. That was me and him. Like, yeah. how good is this uh, game? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Holy shit. Good. How good can you be at hockey? <laughs> like, how, you can't be that much better than me. Yeah. No, yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah they are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so coming out of Maine, though, I mean, 95 points that year. So many in, in the course of the four years there. Are you frustrated to not get a chance in the NHL right away, or did you like? What was your mindset in, in, when when college ended for your for your next few years turning pro? Yeah, you know, I did get a good opportunity my okay. first year. I, I don't think I took good enough advantage of it. Um, then, unfortunately, I never got that same opportunity. But I look back at it, and I think the reason that I have such a vast knowledge of different coaches because I didn't make it. You know, I wasn't with the same coach for five years. I switched coaches almost every 18 months because I was a suitcase. And I took so many yeah. good things from certain coaches and certain things coaches I would never do. Yeah. I would never treat a player like that. I saw what it, how it crushed a player. You know, and then you see another coach and he comes in and he explains something. And I always relate it to people who don't understand. It's like you go to a math teacher and he might be brilliant, but if he can't, explain it in yeah. layman's terms and it's the same thing with a coach you know two plus two is four it's that simple when a great coach gets up there and explains it to you and now it makes sense and you just go out and play right instead of uh, if the puck goes here you go here the puck goes there you go here and here you got to stir don't turn your back on the puck like, well wait just where am i supposed to go like, that's like, why i didn't go to play. princeton right there <laughs> <laughs> you know? but that's probably what you mean in terms of sean wallace made it easier yeah, he right? made it easy. The puck's yeah. going here. If you're under pressure, these are where your outs are. If you're not under pressure, play. Go make a play. And when you join the Blues, they had Shanahan, Hull, a couple characters in the room. But one other name, uh, Peter Stastny, I know it was late in, his, late, late in his career. There, Did you play on a line with him at all? I must have learned a few things from him as well. No, I didn't play on a line okay. with him. Um, but I did. It was, when he came into our locker room, you could see the intensity and the leadership in him. Uh, just a brilliant hockey mind. I remember him coming in the room and... It was the first game he played for us, and the power play didn't go well in the first. He took over the board, and he's got Hull and Shanahan, and he's got Jeff Brown and Housley, and he said, "Where the puck's going here?" And Craig Janney, and we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And I get no one told Hully what to do on the ice, you know. And Hully was looking at us. I got eighty six goals in this league last year. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I risked my life to get over. Put yeah. your yeah. pen away, <laughs> Peter. Put your pen away. <laughs> um, the other run that, as a player, I looked up is late '90s with the Phantoms, Philly Phantoms, and some huge years in the AHL, and, and no call up from the Flyers that year. Was that surprising? Did that 
shock you a little bit or, or was it kind of just like this team's loaded up top and this is what it is yeah it wasn't surprising actually i yeah. signed a three-year deal um just because philly was a great place to play in the minors and if there ever yeah. was injuries maybe i'd get called up you know but it was a dynamite place to live uh and the flyers were loaded at that time. yeah they were stacked i mean their fourth teams. line center was joel otto you know? <laughs> <laughs> where am i gonna fit in yeah <laughs> is it true you came out with the nickname legion of doom yeah it is true and it was one of my uh best friends in montreal was a huge flyers fan and uh they had just john leclerc and i were in that package that went to philadelphia together and he goes on a line with renberg and uh, lindros and they were so big and they were so dominant like they were averaging yeah. four and a half points their first like 10 or 15 games and i just a reporter came in and was like man how do people stop them i'm like i don't know you're doomed they're like the legion of doom and my buddy had said that to me i didn't follow wrestling but he did and that's where he got it. They're the Legion of Doom. And I just said it, and the reporter put it in the paper. So my wow, buddy, man. my buddy Tommy, takes full credit for it. Did he get it. any money from all the T-shirts and hat <laughs> sales for that? No? Not a, not a business <laughs> money. Tommy's still looking to collect. <laughs> well, you mentioned Montreal. I want to go back a little. To, uh, you got traded then for Guy Cabin. It was a short stint. But that must have been a huge thrill for you being a Montreal guy to be able to put that jersey on for a few games. Oh, you're right. It was. Uh, I remember um, first game was an exhibition game. And I remember you know, putting on the red jersey and looking down and seeing the CH crest. And, you know, they had won four cups by between the ages of six and ten in, in a row. And those guys, so many of them were heroes. And now I'm looking over and there's Patrick Waugh getting dressed. Kirk Muller's there. You know, it was uh, it was a great moment. Unfortunately, they were looking to get big and five foot seven doesn't yeah. fit with big. <laughs> not, not in any sport. <laughs> I guess when you pull that jersey on the first time in the form, do you, does it feel different? Do you almost feel like Superman a little bit just because of the history, the, the culture behind that jersey? Do you feel oh, a little little taller, I guess? Yeah, I, I mean, I just felt incredibly thankful, you know, to be, have the opportunity to be there. That That's what I remember. So Merle said, said to me, last year playing pro, you were player coach. Is that true? Yeah. What... Like, who came to you with that idea? How did that all come about? And, and what are your day-to-day, -day, like, I mean, you're practicing, but also running practice? How did it work? You know, Reg Dunlop. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the funny thing was, is how that idea came to me, like, I thought my career was over. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'd gone over to uh, Russia, and I came back, find out I had a sports hernia. And I was like, man, it might be time. Body starting, to, you know, that's 35. And... Um, I went, I saw Joel Quenville in um, a sports bar in St. Louis. And I said, like, can I pick your brain and have lunch with you tomorrow? He's like, yeah, sure. And I pick, I said, I want to get into coaching. I, I think this is what I could be good at. And I said, before I dive into a, you know, nine to five or sales job of some sort. And he goes, well, you know, just apply. And I did a couple of interviews, but didn't really get any traction to be a coach or an assistant coach was what I was looking at. And he goes, something to think about is be a, player assistant that's what he did his last year no in the american shit. league so i i reached out to american league teams and I, I almost had a bite i think it was with the islanders and greg cronin was there um but it didn't work out didn't materialize and then there was a um united hockey league team in st louis and it was actually the year of the lockout um oh, okay so, so better uh, probably than the league right yeah the league was better but uh, the opportunity was presented itself i was like hey i'm only going to do this if i have the opportunity to be an assistant coach and you know the balance between being one of the boys in the locker room yeah. and also supporting the head coach that was new for me and but it was a real good experience uh killer kamensky was my uh was the head coach really <laughs> yeah oh my god well, well biz, great guy biz isn't here and he wouldn't let you skip over russia that quickly there's Nobody likes the Russian stories better than him. <laughs> He's just amazed by yeah, it. Yeah, you got you got you must have had something from the Where 20 were you games in Ufa. I was in Ufa. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I it was she didn't mind Ufa when I was when I was over there and we played him. Yeah, I guess I got two r good stories that I remember. Um one was like I was I lived about two kilometers from the rink. And they had a taxi driver basically drive me from there to the rink every day. And I was getting bored of just going and sitting in my hotel room. I didn't have internet, didn't have anything. Oh my so God. halfway along, there was this place, restaurant, beer garden. And uh, so I started becoming my place to hang out and eat, you know. And uh, I remember after one of our games, we won. And I wasn't, 
Russian mentality for the players where they don't trust you until they get to know you. So it takes time. Um, so I was on my own a lot and we had a big win. And by then I had met a gal that spoke English, spent the summer in California. She got me an internet card. She got me a phone card. Lifesaver. Lifesaver, <laughs> you know? And so the boys all show up at that restaurant bar and here I am. Hey, Monty owns it. I'm in the middle. <laughs> <Oompa>. <laughs> now I'm one of the boys. They took me everywhere after that. The other one was, you know, we're bussing uh, to, I think, Magnitogorsk, where Malkin's from. And halfway through the bus, you stop off. And, you know, and here you stop off. You got your choice of Burger King or Zabaros or something, you know, mm -hmm. in the pit stop. Well, there it's just people on like tables pulled out and they're selling fish and it's full of fishes. With oh, their head. Yeah. They're cutting their heads off in front of you. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, Hey, where's the bathroom? Oh, it's right back there. So I walk back into what I think is a bathroom and everything's outside. And it's just like the cement wall. And I walk in there, the stench, it's just <laughs> holes in the ground. Right. <laughs> I wasn't going in that I talked stuff. about it on uh, Checklist Game Notes about it in China being the holes and in Russia, just the hole. Yeah. People are amazed yeah. by it. Yeah. Uh, it's just drop tr oh. your trousers. No toilet paper. No flusher. <laughs> I mean, this wasn't even the KHL. This is just this, Russia. This Russian man. Super League. Russian <laughs> Super League. He was getting paid in a paper bag like you see over there. Yeah. So you get to Notre Dame and then... And then when you went to, when when you went to RPI, did you have a plan of how long you'd be there, how long you hoped to be there? Because it was four or five years, right? You were the assistant there. I was four years there. Yeah. And, and were you looking to maybe get a head coaching job in, in college, but it, it took to go to the USHL to to get that first head coach experience? Yeah, basically, like I've always been a person that I I just get immersed in the moment and. So I was loving trying to help Seth Apper rebuild RPI. Yeah. And we were starting to have a lot of success on the recruiting trails. The teams incrementally were getting better. And then out of the blue, I got a, a phone call from John Cooper. He's like, I remember he's first like, hey, are you coming? He's at the time in Green Bay in the USHL. And he's like, are you comfortable in your job? I'm like, this sounds weird. I go, what do you got? He goes, Are you well, testing me? Yeah. You know, you're, li you're living upstairs Franco's dentistry <laughs> in, a, in a studio apartment. Franco's going to love it that we're talking. I still text with him. Uh, that was my landlord, a great dentist. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So he had, so then the, the owners, uh, Brad Kwong, who actually lives here in Newton now with his family, called me and uh, was a week later and was like, would you like to apply for the job as a head coach? And I was like, you know what? It's, it was time to try. And it was a great league. And, you know, Cooper then went on to the American League. Blashill had just left and gone on to um, Western at the time. So it had yep. been a proving ground that if you go there, you get experience. It's actually the best year I had in my growth as a coach. Really? Because you have to do so much at the junior level. You have to wear a lot of hats. Yeah. Um, but the first year, I think you go from being an assistant to a head coach you really grow because you're making every decision and it's good to do it at a lower level. Um, like I have a lot of admiration for Rod Brindamore who did it at the NHL level and does done it so well. Yeah. It's almost like to be able to hop right in there and do it. It's like you don't learn at all from being with younger guys and doing all those different roles. It's impressive just to hop right in there. Like you mentioned, that's true. Dubuque there. You won two championships in the three years, but I'm sure the listeners want to hear like, what was Johnny Goudreau like back then? Like, how did you find him? How'd you get him there? Was he, did you know he's going to be this good? Did not know he was going to be this good. Right. Um, I don't think anyone can look at a guy that's five, seven, 130 pounds and think, He's going to get 110 points in the NHL. Um, but how we got him was uh, the head scout, Bobby Kinsella, was like, you're going to think I'm crazy, but he goes, I think we should go after this kid. He goes, he's the best midget offensive player I saw. And I go, where does he live? He told me. I'm like, well, it's John Stevens lives there. John Stevens has a son that's that age. So I called up Rambo, and, you know, Johnny's like, uh, he goes, he's the best offensive player I've seen in this area he goes no question he goes his dad ran the rink that our phantoms team in 98 won a chance where we practiced was it like dad was. or was this a different yeah, yeah yeah and so anyways um i called him convinced him to sign uh independent because we, we had like six free agent contracts at that time that's what they called him and uh we signed him he came to camp and he was really good in camp but my idea was and it was funny northeastern's like you're gonna have him for three years 
We have one year, he 78 points as a rookie, won rookie of the year, was our leading scorer in the playoffs. Uh, but my funniest story about him on the ice was I would watch, we had a two-on-one drill, and he would do something so creative every time. I would always end it on the last, I want to see Johnny one more time. <laughs> <laughs> What's he going to do now? And then the other one was when, he, when the NHL scouting combine came and they were to weigh him. And so he tapes like eight pucks underneath his shorts and he's standing there and the pucks drop as he's on the scale. And the guy goes, I'll put you down as 138. I'll give you an extra three pounds. Yeah. I wonder what he weighs now, actually. He's probably only a buck fifty now, I bet. Maybe a little more. Yeah, 165, right? I would say max. Yeah. Fuck. Dropping hundreds out of his uh, you find yeah, the way exactly. instead of pucks. <laughs> exactly. Hey. Monty, uh, three years at Dubuque, you won two titles. Uh, was that when you realized I got a gift for this for the coaching thing? Or, or did it come later? You know what I realized then is that I had the ability to get everybody to believe that we could do something really well together. Um, that I connected with people that how we could play and how we were going to do it, um, I could tell the players believed in it. So that gave me confidence that I could go to the next level. Had you been applying, or after the two titles, did you apply to different schools, or had Denver reached out to you? What was the connection to getting there? I mean, a true uh, blue blood program in college hockey, I'd say, with the history that, that's happened at Denver. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I was still, we were playing in my third year in Dubuque, and, you know, we were the best team in the league. Like, that team was really dominant. And I think it was maybe in April, early April, um, the University of Denver reached out to me. Wow, that's and, nice. Yeah. And, you know, they were doing the search, and they're like, you're one of the people. And and I went through the search, and I was one of the four finalists and was very lucky to get the offer. I still remember I was supposed to fly home, like, at 2 o'clock. And they said, well, it's going later. We'll fly you in a private jet to your game. And I'm like, okay, I'll stay around. <laughs> like, I'll wait here three yeah. weeks to yeah. fly on a PJ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, shit. So those are in, you did an interview. Like, are you nervous before that type of interview or not really? Because you're so prepared. Yeah, you have a lot of time to prepare. Yeah. You know, so you go in there and it's, uh, you know, I think the more you do interviews, the more you get really confident how to prepare. You, as long as you're prepared, it's like anything. Um, you know, if you're prepared and you've trained all summer, you go into camp, you feel confident, you go out and you, you get ready for the season quite confidently. It's the same thing for an interview. You got to know who you're interviewing with. That's the most important part. Had you guys had a chance at winning the national title prior to the year that you got it done? Had you had a run in the final four? I don't remember those. Yeah, we were, in a, we were in a frozen four the year before we lost to a great North Dakota team that beat us three, two in the final minute. Oh, my Schmalt God. Scored. Oh yeah, he's a good player. Yeah. I got to bring up a, a big name. He's one of your probably best players you ever coached from Denver, Rudy. Our boy Rudy from <laughs> from Barstool. He claimed the fame that he won a national title with you. I still don't believe he played. <laughs> yeah. He did. He did. <laughs> yeah. What a character. Great kid. I call him a kid because that's how I knew him. Oh, he's still a kid. Yeah. yeah. And he just had an incredible personality. Was clearly one of the most liked players in the program. Um, and he didn't play uh, in the Frozen Four of the year we won, but he played almost every game the following year. And um, I think I made a coaching mistake in the final eight, um, and we didn't have great legs that, that game because we lost to Ohio State. Ohio State played great, but the Frozen Four, the other three teams, we were 8-0 against. Oh, So if we beat Ohio State. Matchups. Yeah, good matchups for us. He told us a funny story we had to ask you about um, – one time you guys got on the road, or maybe it was the, I don't know when it was, but the sticks didn't come up, and you made them practice pretending like they were <laughs> holding sticks. <laughs> Where'd you get that idea? Uh, we're a Western. I just said, I said, we're going to go out there. We can only do our first three drills. Yeah. We just need to move the legs for 20 minutes so that we're okay tomorrow night. And it was funny. The guys were really creative. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, the, the starting goaltender, they, they must have all said it. We're not going to score on him. No one celebrated on the fake shots. <laughs> but on the backup, they were going bar down every time. <laughs> Did not you guys hit tra a bunch of traffic on the way to one of the games during the playoffs and the, the bus driver just pulled the page out of Sandra Bullock's book, uh, book and just flooded it? Went, went by everybody, went past the police. That's that a national split. championship game. Oh, it was the Natty. Okay. Yeah. 
It was in Chicago, and the bus driver just went off the rails and just started hammering. <laughs> we, were, we thought we were on uh, speed, you know, the movie Speed, when you hit the bump and the people's heads are hitting. 55. It was uh, it was good. So at Denver, when did the, uh, an NHL gig first come up on the radar then? Did like Dallas reach out to you first? Did you hear something from an agent? How did yeah, that all not, play? not to interrupt yeah, you, sure. but some I was I was bringing that up. Like Sometimes it, it looks as the a college coaching job could be just the perfect gig for 35 years. So you had to really probably figure out, do I want to keep doing this or go to the show? Like, not to interrupt you, but... You're right. It was really hard to leave Denver. Right? I mean, uh, you would have been good forever. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a city person. I grew up in a city. Uh, so did my wife. She's from St. Louis, you know? And so for Emily and I to leave Denver, which was a great city, you got only about three cities that are t- four cities. You got Boston, you got Minnesota, Columbus, and Denver, probably, that are real... S- cities you know that you could coach college hockey in and yeah. so if you're going to decide to leave um you know you got to make sure it's the right thing for your family and um so i first interviewed i think after my second year in uh denver with calgary but i could tell like that was it was a good experience but there was no way i was getting the job um then i think in the next year i interviewed in buffalo in florida i believe um and i think i was a finalist in florida but i pulled out it was taking too long and i don't think i was getting a job but it was wasn't right for the pro it didn't feel right yeah um and then that following year um the year after national championship um you know i had the rangers called and dallas and both incredible situations and then dallas really uh, got aggressive with it and we had to make a decision it's either I felt if I said no to the NHL, then it was never going to come back because it was kind of like fourth time you're going through the interview process, even though it's the first time I was offered a job. um, It just felt like you, if you're going to do this, it's going to, we're going to do this now. It'd probably get around to teams. Like he said, no, we offered him a job and everyone's like, all right, he's probably good with college. Yeah. He wants to be Jerry York, which, you know, which I did think about. Yeah, oh, you know, Jerry York's a great coach, great person. And uh, after Dallas, you did, did about a year and a half there. You were assistant for Craig Berube in St. Louis. What, what kind of things did you learn playing, uh, coaching under him? Did you any new tricks you pick up? You know, how to hold players accountable in a uh, to the results of what their role is. Um, I really learned how he did that. Uh, I learned how he's great under pressure. The, the harder the pressure, the pressure mounts, losing streaks or players not playing well, superstars not scoring, um, and maybe the, the bench going the wrong way. Like, he had a great ability to bring everybody back to focusing about control what you control and letting people be themselves, you know. Um, he never got too high about anything. Um, and the way he treated his staff, wonderful man to work for. You know, he made you, he empowered you, he let you do your thing and um, was just gave you a lot of confidence. So I think everybody, and he did the same thing for the players. I think that's why players love playing for him. Wasn't Otter back there with you too, Steve Vaught? Oh, yeah. Otter's a beaut. <laughs> I, he must never stop talking from the bench, right? He never stops. Oh, he's unbelievable. I love that guy. I hated playing against him, but he's a great dude. He is a wonderful man. He's a brilliant hockey mind, and uh, the players really enjoy playing for him. See him being a head coach someday? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk some St. Louis too because I, I I know like development like that's probably your strongest quality as a coach, and I couldn't help but notice Cairo and Thomas taking like huge leaps the last couple of years when you were in St. Louis with them. Did you work with them, or am I a crazy person? Well, I, I mean, we all worked with them, um, but I think Ott and myself uh, because we were the forward coaches spent the most time with them. Um, You know, first of all, they're two outstanding talents. You don't put up numbers like they're putting up without the ability. They needed uh, the mental freedom to believe in themselves. And I think they got that through Chief and through the work that Otter and I did with them with video and, you know, giving them the confidence that not only can you be play in this league but you can dominate in this league and it's fun to still watch them yeah it's just, I, I remember rpi you had all these little righties that you turned into all americans <laughs> and now you, those two little righties in yeah. st louis are all stars so there's just some there's he definitely was, just something he there. was a righty that's little righty it it, it, that's how it <laughs> yeah. works i yeah. don't know <laughs> come on dude it was something that maybe uh, one of your coaches did whether whether you were coaching or playing that you vowed I, I will never do that to a, to a player you don't have to say that name but just maybe a, a particular thing a coach did you that you thought was useless. One of the biggest lessons I learned was 
When I was in Russia, uh, when the guy punched the player in the face, you're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, this coach was really hard on everybody. Um, and that's the way they do things there back then. I don't know if they still do that, but this is 20 years ago now. And you got yelled at for everything. And I remember he sat me out a couple of games because he didn't think I was working hard enough in practice. Um, and he probably was right. And I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And so I just started working, working. I sat out those two games. I got put back in. And I remember I started playing real well. And then like maybe five games later, our team didn't play well. And I thought I played well. And he yanked me out of the lineup after that. And I remember him yelling at me the next time in practice. And I was just like looking at him and I'm like, you know, you lost me yeah. because you weren't fair. And that's the biggest thing I took is I always want to be fair with players. I want to be honest. Um, and sometimes it's hard because unfortunately, like even now in the NHL, you got 23 players. So there's three players not playing every game. You know, and as the season wears on, it tends to be the same players over usually, um, you know, that are the odd man out. And there's, you know, trying to communicate to guys when um, you're not playing them and keeping them upbeat, trying, telling them to be ready. Uh, that's the hardest part, I think, of the job, you know, helping players get better that are playing minutes and showing them stuff on power play or showing them stuff on puck protection or how to end plays. Um, that's the fun part, and players usually love eating that up. Uh, you mentioned when you were a player coach in terms of being one of the boys in the room and then being an assistant coach. It kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with being an assistant last year and then going to the head coach this year. Like We've asked other coaches about that, but what is the hardest thing? Just almost not being able to joke around a little bit. And, but I feel like you still may do that. Like, What is the difference in terms of dealing with guys as the head versus the assistant? Yeah, I think uh, as an assistant, there's, there's less pressure you can be more friendly um but i think the biggest uh place of growth i've had from my head stint in dallas to here is i think i wasn't myself enough in dallas as far as being friendly as far as i'm not afraid now to put myself out there and tell the players a story about my playing days. I think that if you're yourself and you're genuine, whether you're delivering good news or you're telling them, um, you know, a teaching moment that they need to be better in, um, I think players, as long as you're honest and you're being fair to them, they're, they might not like it, but they're going to listen and they're going to try and do what you're, you're asking of them. I talked to a couple of guys, uh, get some, not dirt on you, some, some information. They referred to you as the Pied Piper in a good way. And, they, and I wondered, did that come natural? where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> did, that, did that come natural to you or something that you just picked things up along the way? Because, I mean, I went back and watched the old video and you kind of had that, you know, presence already when you were playing in Maine. It's like, it, so it seems like you had it from the jump. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think you are the environment you grow up in. I, my dad was a natural leader. You know, he wore the captain in football and in basketball teams that won Canadian championships. Um, he was a leader of the union at Shell Oil. So I, I think I picked up a lot from him. And I, I don't think, I think in team surroundings, I've always been very comfortable to step up, whether I was wearing a letter or not as a player. And I think that carried over to being confident when I'm in the middle of the room. I got one final one. I got to ask about Patrice Bergeron. Has he kind of like blown you away? I know you probably had expectations, but has he exceeded them from what you've seen so far just in a few months? Absolutely. Um, just the, his ability to be, uh, of being cognizant of how everybody around him is doing, that takes a lot of energy from just not being able to prepare yourself to be great, which he is. And I've learned from him of how to be a better person, not only a better leader, but be a better person. That's how impactful he is. Did you get one of those Louis bags that I saw all the players get the other day? No, I haven't impacted him that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great way to end it, Monty. We, we can't thank you enough. I mean, it's been amazing uh, to see you come back and have so much success here. So congratulations. Good luck the rest of the way. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks. Uh, thank pleasure. You. Hopefully Merle, you. thank yep. you, bud. Thanks Hopefully see you on a duck boat in about six months. All right, before we go any further, we're going to take a minute to talk about our merch. We heard Whit mention it a little while ago. He needs some big deal, bro. I'm sure G's going to get it out to him. We just dropped these not too long ago. New chiclet shirts. We have Canadian versions of it. You can get up in the Great White North, our favorite country up there. And like I just said, the big deal, Bruin, Pink Whitney. We got all kinds of stuff. We've been doing this for a long time. We got the classic jerseys. Gee, what's your favorite right now? 
My favorite right now, RA, is the winter hats. I got the Big Deal Brewing winter hat on right now. I also we also have uh, some Pink Whitney uh, winter hats, the Spit and Chicklets winter hats. It's getting cold here in New York. Uh, my ears get freezing, so anytime I can put on a nice uh, Big Deal Brewing toque, as they say up north, I'm happy to do it. And all you got to do, very simple, BarstoolSports.com slash chicklets. I also love the uh, the new Pink Whitney rowback hoodies we have. Yeah. They're so comfortable, so soft, nice and thin, so you can basically wear it at any times. It, it doesn't get any better than the chicklets merch right now. And if we didn't have chicklets merch, we'd be naked every day, Grinelli, because that's all we wear. It's Literally, all- I would be naked. I have no clothes uh, right now, so that's and- all I'm wearing right now, and I'm happy to do it. Very happy to do it, R.A., and nobody wants to see us naked either, but it's always comfortable, always epic designs, always guaranteed to impress. The Barstool store has everything for everyone. Once again, shop now at store.barstoolsports.com. Man, huge thanks to Monty for coming in with us last week at the hotel room. Awesome chat with him. Anytime we get a, a current coach, it's always a big thrill for us, but he made it so easy talking about, like you said, what he had two careers, you know, the the pro playing career, now the pro coaching career. And you could see why the guys in that room respond to him, any guys who played for him. So thanks again, Monty. Uh, great time with you and, and his team. I mean, I know we'll bro, stroke off the Bruins again. It's like, hey, man, when they keep fucking setting records every week, then we're going to stroke them off. And right now I'm to double wrist them, biz. I mean, they're 32, four and four, the best start in the modern era of hockey, which is to say post ex- expansion. Uh, they beat up Anaheim, what, seven to one Sunday night. They have home the points in 14 straight games, haven't lost at home in regulation. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. And then Bergeron, he hit 600 assists on Sunday. And the night before that, he assisted on Marshawn's goal to make him third place on the Bruins' all-time points list, list after uh, Bork and Busick. So I don't know. Wait, the, the more they keep doing this, we got, we got to acknowledge it. We would do for any team. It, it's an insane team. Um they're, they're so well-rounded. DeBrusque goes on long-term IR. Feel bad for him having a career year. And Craig Smith goes up in the lineup and looks phenomenal. And after a season where a lot of people have wondered kind of what's going on with him, boom, it looks like he's found his stride. It's They have all the makings of a, of a Stanley Cup winning team. Let's see if they can get the job done. Interestingly enough, I saw in The Athletic, there's a great Monday column. I don't know. Oh, I feel bad not knowing the guy's name. Brown, I believe it is. It, and and he, he talks about the Bruins are crushing every other division in the league. I think, I don't even know if they've lost to any teams from any other division, but they've struggled in the Atlantic. So it's interesting that that, now granted, those are most of your games, but that's that's probably the best division in the league. So it makes sense, but it's not as easy to say right away. And he writes that they can hop right out and, and get out of the Atlantic through two rounds. So that'll be an amazing test, but just... It's it's a fun team to watch, and people think I'm a Bruins fan. I'm, I I root for them, but I'm not really like I don't really care in the end. What are I? You I think you're a Bruins fan. I think you're a Bruins fan. That's a good thing. Yeah, you gotta gotta be I mean, loyal to know, the home team. I, nah, I know you, I mean, like I would see when I think of the Bruins, I I'd love to see them win a Stanley Cup because I'd love to see Bergeron win one as the captain. Um, but like no, if they if I I really I I don't really care if they lose. I just. What's cool is being the local team around here, they're so fun to watch. And the one thing about them is they go down to nothing. It's like live bet auto city. It's just, it, it, it is, it is, uh, it's the best team in the league by a mile. And, and we'll see how the second half goes. I, I, I don't think they're going to go 32, four and four again, but they're going to be the, they're going to be the president's trophy winner unless something drastic happens and they're going to be the Stanley cup favorite. So Bruins fans are getting a special run and it's all thanks to biz picking them to miss the playoffs real quick. Before we move on from the bees, uh, McAvoy went on the empty netters podcast and he actually told a story how, uh, Brad Marshan uh, is so superstitious. He didn't want to change his gloves for the winter classic. So he spray painted his black warrior gloves gold. And he, they didn't know if he was going to get fined. He just went in and was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm not changing my gloves and just spray painted him gold. Have you guys ever seen something like that? Uh, I've yeah, seen some guys, guys not want to switch their gear. gear. Yeah. But I've actually seen that makes sense because he plays with like holes in his glove. Like, yeah. And I mean, they had so just for, for reference, the Bruins had to wear like gold gloves and and he didn't want to switch up from his normal black gloves. So he spray painted them completely. So what gold. did they spray paint? Did they spray paint him back? Oh, I, I would guess so. Yeah, I guess he has a two pair rotation that he just rotates oh. between the two pairs and he spray painted one of them gold and he's going to use the other black. Pair I use new gloves, Biz, every like six games. I love the new gloves. I felt like I shot the puck a little harder. 
But that's probably because I have weak yeah, wrists. Yeah, some guys would have like four pairs of gloves on rotation and they would have them on the heater. So after like two or three shifts in the period, they get the new warm. Yeah, setup. yeah. I was switching every period a couple of times. Yeah, that's a bit extreme. That's the that's hero that's act. Nuts. Absolute yeah. hero act by me. One more little quick hand gallop. Pasta, man. This guy's unbelievable. Four points in that game versus Anaheim. Hat trick and an assist. He has goals in 25 of the 40 Bruins games. In points in 34 of the 40 games, uh, 32 goals, 26 assists for 58 points in 40 games. I mean, another MVP candidate we're talking about, third in scoring. I just love having him in Boston. Sign the fucking guy. He's already going to cost you 11, 12 mil. But even when you get to meet him, like we've had him on the show, boys, he's he's just such a gregarious, friendly guy. He's just very easy to root for, you know? Oh, so I to- Did I tell you guys what he said to me? I saw him at a uh, steakhouse in Boston and uh, I didn't see him. I was sitting at the bar with my wife and I, I get a pat on the back. And I turn around. He's like, "Oh, I see you spending the Pink Whitney money." <laughs> he's 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 very he's like a fucking hilarious dude. He's the and Tasmanian he loves the game. Devil. He made a great point to Keith Yandel about like how cool his skates were for the Winter Classic. He's like, "Why can't we do this stuff all the time?" Like, I I I think he's super into uh, you know, having fun within the game, and you can just tell when he's on the ice. I I actually also forgot that he won the Rock of Richard. I think he shared it one year with maybe Ovi. Ovi, I, I believe. Yeah, I forgot that that he had ha- he he has a uh, one of those, and I wouldn't be surprised if he gets it this year. Is that voice you do animal, or is it? Uh, Tasmanian I think it's like devil? my. Ch- it's like that's my Ladislav Smeed, uh, another Czech beauty. He's gonna come on the show at one point. One of the all time funniest people I've ever met. So he used to yell at Tom Gilbert like this, you fucking baby dolphin teeth. <laughs> uh, we got to give a shout out to Alaska biz uh, Thursday in L.A. It was the first time in NHL history that two Alaska born goalies were in net uh, as Phoenix Copley was in net for the Kings. Jeremy Swayman from the Bruins. Phoenix Cope is it Copley or Copley? I say Copley because that's how it's say it in Boston. What a he's run from, he's on oh. North Pole. He's from North Pole, Alaska, and Swayman's from Anchorage. So nice little history made by it by a he's couple from guys. the like North to, Pole. The, the, the name of the city is North Pole, Alaska. Yeah, with the town. Yeah. Jesus. I yeah. Told was he on a 10 and 2 start right now Pole. with the Kings this year? Yes. And they need, they were in desperate need of some goaltending because the rest of the team has been fine. And I, I, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I see them as a threat in the West. If they keep getting that type of goaltending, you got to think that they, like Kopitar and Doughty ain't getting any younger. And you have a really, really good top nine. If Byfield can in the second half get going offensively, like think about all the like the 30 point guys they have right now. Like they just have a, a really well balanced offense and maybe a little bit of oomph on, on the fourth line. Like they like maybe like a like a Nick Benino or somebody who's been there and has that experience to help them maybe, you know, kill penalties or give them a little bit of momentum for those deeper lines. Like they got Fiala, they got Arvidsson, they got Velarde, good, they got Velarde. Kopitar, and, and I'll tell you, they got Deneau some is, is like maybe the now new most underrated player in the league. Fucking guy, dude. He just shuts people down. He adds the offense. What a signing that was. Well, Not he even doesn't have to money be either. the one. He doesn't have to be the number one there either, right? So it's just a, a very comforting thing with having Kopitar him and, and then going as a number two. So I don't know. I'd like to see them try to make a deadline move that Quickie's not able to play to, to where he used to. And he's had a tough start to the season. He makes six million bucks. I just see him as more of a leader in that room. So I don't see them moving on from him, even though I believe it's the last year of his yeah, deal. He's like you need year. him. And I don't, you know, I, so it's also a lot of money. And like you think about like what you could get for, for with that amount of dough to go out and, and, and add somebody at the deadline. But I basically say count that whole count that as a dream. But uh, it, definitely a good team in the West. They'll do something, though. Blake Blake's not going to sit around, I don't think. He knows, you, you, like you mentioned, there's a couple. Uh, the good thing is they do have these young guys coming up, but they they gotta they gotta make a make a splash. They gotta love stories like that with with the goalie Copley Copley. There, just you know, journeyman been around. Two guys get hurt, and then he steps up. And he's playing the best hockey of his life, and the team needs it most. Man, there's so many amazing goalies in yeah. so many different leagues. It's like. It's one of those positions. Give a guy a chance and just watch somebody run with it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Biz, you, you uh, put this feather in your cap. The 2023 Winter Classic at Fenway was the most watched regular season game ever on cable. Uh, averaged 1.8 million viewers, peaked with 2.1 million late in the day, uh, up 31% from last year. Uh, the game also set merch records both at Fenway and online. Jerseys accounted for 70, 72% of the sales uh, and Sid and Pasta were the best-selling jerseys for each team. So 
get that hockey related uh, revenue up, up and up and fucking. They were only watching the because Biz had his shirt halfway down. Yeah. his serious. Like he was I going might, to a club. I had my belly button out for the for the people at home. Uh, probably had nothing to do with the fact that Wayno was there shaking people's hand. Did we go to the full breakdown of, of how that happened? He shook, he shook somebody's hand and the person's like, well, kid, did we roll the clip actually? Yeah, we already did this. Oh, we already did that. Okay. Well, we're getting, Smoke we're getting weed, deep. Turtle. We're getting in the weeds here, folks. We're getting to the end of the podcast, but, uh, a great broadcast. We had a blast and a very successful winter classic. And it's nice to see that they're bringing in that dough. Hopefully the bees get a little bit of that pasta Jersey sale. Because they're going to need it to pay him in free agency, bitch. Goddamn right. Uh, a couple more notes before we finish up shop here. Uh, the Rangers signed Jimmy Vesey to a two-year, $1.6 million extension. Uh, the 29-year-old vet has seven goals and seven assists and 40 games played this year. And he's one of the key yeah, one of the key pen- penalty killers on that team, as well as a pretty well-liked guy in the locker room. They were busting his balls down there because I think he was doing a promo or something with Dunkin' Donuts. And they, they said, what's your order? And he had like an iced coffee and a plain bagel. And like you're in New York City, like the bagel capital of the world, they were all giving him shit for like like a plain bagel f- from Dunks instead of like. I love V's, great guy. Uh, His father's super. a great person, and and I'm really happy to see him. You know, he bounced around a bit, and he ends up back in New York, where he's obviously most comfortable because that's where he signed out of college, and he hasn't turned into you know top two line scorer. But he's made his way into the NHL as a great third fourth liner, penalty killer, could chip in 10, 15 goals. I'm really happy for him. Have you Absolutely. talked to him? Did he spend time trying to develop those other other intangibles, knowing that he couldn't crack it as a top two line guy? No, no criticism got, whatsoever. Uh, Just sometimes got, those guys go ahead. Sorry, sorry, buddy. He got bit uh, by uh the golf bug. So okay. that's what he does in the summer. No training going on. Yeah, I saw his dad the other night. It was always a pleasure to see Big Jim. And I think I, I mentioned it before, it's kind of reminiscent of what Tommy Fitz did years ago when he played in the league. You know, he was a scorer everywhere he was. And he had to adapt his game and kind of become a, a check and center and a penalty killer. And you're kind of seeing this a little later with another, uh, I guess, towny related hockey hockey player. So pretty cool to see make that make that switch and, you know, still have his career going. He loves it down there. Let's see, Detroit plays forward uh, Jacob Browner on waivers. Uh, he did clear waivers. Then he was assigned to Grand Rapids. This was not long after he came out of the employee assistance program. Uh, he's got one more year left on his deal at a five and a quarter million dollar hit. Uh, it seemed biz like a calculated risk by Steve UI here. I figured nobody would bite. And if they did, then he'd get some cap relief. I know his guy's still skilled, but uh, he basically he's down in the minus now. And uh, I'm not sure what's going on. I think somebody said he he took his the team information off his Instagram so I, I don't know if this is an ugly situation or, or just one that's going to fix itself. What's your take on it? No, I agree with you. It was de- definitely strategic, probably you know a little bit right before the deadline. I don't think a lot of teams maybe expected him. And you don't have long to, to, to act on it. I believe you're on the waiver wire for, what, 24 hours, maybe 48 hours. So, yeah, I, I, a calculated risk. And you know, I could he'll probably be back in the league next year. Just needs to go down there. And and, and I thought they were going to send him down on a conditioning stint to start. And then maybe it switched to, to the, to the waivers, right? Cause it originally they, it was conditioning stint, wasn't it? He, yeah, he did that. He did the conditioning stint uh, and then the waivers was, was a separate move. Okay. So basically well, I, maybe he's just not ready for the, for the big club or they don't want him there yet. He was highly he, touted. He came over from uh, in, in that Mantha trade and, and you know, he, he was yeah. fucking buzzing on offense. So, I mean, I, I would imagine he's still got a lot of game left, and I hope to see him back in the NHL soon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we mentioned Blake Wheeler getting hurt in the, the quote, groin a few weeks back. Well, it turns out he actually ugh, ruptured a testicle, and he finished the game. Uh, I mean, is taking one of the plums the worst pain biz or, like, getting cut or, or punched? Like, what's – is? I told the story on the me. podcast before Pittsburgh training camp. I think it was Gonchar. He came and dumped it in over the red line, and I, I didn't wear a jock at that time. There was about an 18-month period where I went no jock playing pro hockey, and he got me square in the nuts. I couldn't finish the rest of the game. Uh, it didn't end up swelling up to this enormous size, but it sucks, buddy. I went through another enlarged nut a couple weeks ago, so my heart goes out to this guy. I feel terrible. Hopefully, he can get the swelling down, and uh, and he can be back in the game action in no time. I couldn't drive Ryder to school one morning because I rolled my ankle getting out of bed, and this guy's playing an NHL game coming back from a fucking – ruptured nut you, you, that you would happen be, in the nba there we go i don't think i've ever even heard of like anyone getting a ruptured nut like oh that just ugh, fucking gives you the willies i don't even know what that means what like the nut just exploded inside of his sack i, I don't know yeah i'm not sure 
I remember those songs when we were kids, when you're flying over Venus and a Martian bites your penis, it's a rupture. Did you have those songs wet? <laughs> I can rupture songs. <laughs> I guess not. Rump <laughs> song. I think he's on mute. <laughs> I'm not on mute. Uh, <laughs> silent laughter then. He just had All nothing right. to say, buddy. Nothing to say. No. I'm sure though some of our listeners are familiar with the old rupture tunes. Anyways, we want to send biz. A ruptured testicle is a health emergency that happens when the membrane holding the testicle breaks. So it's not the testicle itself; it's just the membrane holding the testicle itself. Ooh. Insane. Do they reattach no it, or they just let it be after it, it, the swelling goes down? They can reattach it. Yes. Okay. Then they tell you, biz, no nut for six months. Would you go crazy? Oh yeah, I went fucking like a month. The only That's good it. thing is you'd have like a monster wet dream. Yeah, and I'm anyone kidding. hating on a wet dream is no. oh, freebies, man. They're the ultimate oh my freebies. God. If I can do nothing and wake up with a mess in your pants. All right, moving right along. Uh, we want to send best wishes out to Pete Weber, the voice of the Predators. Uh, he had to take a small hiatus for a medical procedure. They they explained it on NHL.com. Very complex procedure involved in his brain and kind of really wild if you read the details. But he's been with the team since the get-go. He's done both TV and radio. So... Uh, get well, Pete. We're rooting for you. And uh, meanwhile, Max Hurst has done a great job filling in for him down in Nashville. Uh, we also want to send best wishes to uh, Army's Eric Huss. Uh, he was injured Thursday versus Sacred Heart when I took a skate inadvertently to the neck. He was cut pretty bad, but fortunately, Army's athletic trainer, Rachel Leahy, jumped into action immediately. I uh, was able to staunch the bleed him. They got him to the hospital into surgery. Uh, he's out now. He's stable. He's feeling good walking around. And uh, Leahy was given the player of the game championship belt from the team, which is a pretty cool gesture they did. Uh, and, you know, speaking of the trainers and, and these folks who help out athletes, we, uh, good news from Buffalo, from the Bills Mafia. Uh, DeMar Hamlin doing much better. Uh, he's conscious. He was on Twitter. He's sending he out. He left uh, the hospital replies. today. Head back to Buffalo. Oh, that's oh, I, I hadn't caught that. That That's awesome. And how about the when he first came to the first thing he asked was who who won? Who won the Unreal. game? You know, like that's such a such a football guy, and uh, also too, the Bills are going to give him his full pay because you know all these bylaws and and CBAs. They could have, they were only required to pay him whatever the level is when he's on IR. But the the, it's unbelievable to think how a pro team doing something like this just out of the like, kindness of their heart, but they're going to give him his full salary given the circumstances. And then the f- first play of the game, what you must have been watching. Oh, that was just that was straight out of a movie, straight out of a movie to see that guy return the kick. And then he returned another one too. solid special teams by the Patriots. Um, I I don't know if we have the answer. And I feel kind of OK asking this now that thank God the guy's OK. Just the scariest moment I've ever seen on television. But can he play football again? Possibly. Is that even I I I know it's crazy to even discuss and I wouldn't even mention it if he wasn't, you know, if he hadn't left the hospital. But I, I hope I hope he can. But just. Just incredible, and and these trainers are so amazing. Thank God, you know they acted the way they did, and I'll never forget having that game on. And, and when they came back from commercial, Joe Buck, you know they showed Josh Allen was crying, and I think um, Diggs was like shaking his head. You're just like, holy shit! And Joe Buck said, oh, "We have no words." They went back to commercial. I was like, oh my god, is, is he alive? So, just an amazing effort by the training staff and, and what those people did to truly save a guy's life. And, and hopefully he can play football again. I just, I, I know no one would discuss it and there'll be people. Why even asking? But I'm wondering, hopefully he can. No, no I think it highlighted some things definitely like after the game where I guess at one point they were thinking about resuming like after like hey five minute warm up. And that's when like Josh Allen, uh, Burroughs, uh, the coach from the Bills, they stepped in. They said, listen, like, wait, like, let, let's let's even go even like less than that. Like when a guy would have like a nasty leg break, oh. so you would you wouldn't even want to return to action. I know but to see something like that. It's just, hey, man, both teams are just completely out of it. And then R.A., you touched on the salary like that also was something that was highlighted, how cutthroat the NFL is and how it's not guaranteed salaries and how like these guys are treated like meat where it's like, Oh, okay, well we'll cart them off. And five minutes later, we're back to action where it's like, no, no, we're dealing with humans here. And you're talking about the highest grossing sports league. I believe maybe, maybe not compared to soccer, but at least in North America where it's like, how are these guys not getting guaranteed fucking contracts? It's it's fucking, how are you paying your quarterback $45 million and a guy can't get a guaranteed couple million bucks? Like it's, it's, it highlighted some pretty nasty things, but to hear that he's all right and 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 uh, he he did this annual toy drive, and I think he started it when he was in college, 
this GoFundMe for the toy drive generated like four or five million bucks, at least the last that we look. It could be in, in the in, in the double digits. So just the, the way that the community in Buffalo responds to their athletes and anytime they're in a in a moment of need, it is like it's like it's it gives you goosebumps. So the whole city of Buffalo and I guess everybody else too who 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 helped like donate and and uh and, and elevate whatever he was doing good beforehand very very cool to see and uh glad to hear he's all right yeah absolutely and what i, I do i wouldn't be surprised at all if he plays again i mean you think of teddy bruski had a stroke b- back back in the day other guys if it's similar injuries i mean if the doctor okays him then yeah. you know it, it definitely would be back out there but so. uh the nfl network had a doctor on and the doctor just said it's entirely too soon to have that conversation so the question has well, been asked we just don't it, worry so. huh. all right well Guys, great show. Hopefully everybody out there enjoyed it. Um, We'll be back next week in action. Any final thoughts? Chicklets Game Notes coming on Thursday. We also have a vlog recapping the whole Boston trip. RA, we got to see RA's high school. He shows you around Boston. You meet some of his friends. So that's an awesome vlog. You can find that on our YouTube channel coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. Love him. There we go. Thanks for listening. Peace. Have a great one. 